So hello everyone, it's just wonderful uh, that you're all able to join us this evening. My name is Alison Neal and I'm the Chief Executive of the South Georgia Heritage Trust. And uh, I'm joined uh, by my co-host, who is Camilla Nicholl, who's the CEO of the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, and our team here of speakers and panellists. So um, what we wanted to tell you about is uh, our very new uh, series, which is called Southern Ocean Stories. It's a brand new programme of online talks by both of our charities. And the very first topic that we'll be covering tonight is called Museums in the Extreme. And uh, we've got speakers from both of our organisations who will tell you their experiences of what is good, bad and indeed extreme about running and curating a museum in the frozen south. Now, usually at this time of the year, we're get, getting ready for the Antarctic tourist season. Things are different this year because of coronavirus, but even though for safety reasons both of our museums can't open, the work of our teams continues. So we're going to be hearing from Sophie Rao, who is an artefacts expert for the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, followed by Sarah Lurcock, who is SGHT's uh, South Georgia Museum Director, and then Jeff Cooper, who is UK Antarctic Heritage Trust project manager. Following their talks, which will last around 15 minutes each, we'll have a Q&A session, which can be a little bit longer because we're not able to hear from our uh, South Georgia Museum curator, Jane Pierce, unfortunately. But that does give us more time for Q&A and that all questions will need to be through the chat box, please, which you've all obviously familiarized yourselves with, so no problem there. And one more thing to let you know, these talks, as you know, are free, but if you enjoy them, we would like to ask you to consider supporting our charities, because at this time, it's really difficult for us to raise funds to keep our museums going. So thank you in, that, in advance for your support. And now over to our first presenter, who is Sophie. Hello, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. That look good? Can you see it? Just checking. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, I'm very excited um, to be in a huge audience of people from literally everywhere. It's absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'm an artifact conservator and I've been working with UPHT since 2016, um, assessing the condition of the objects that are down in the um, huts in the Antarctic Peninsula um, and to plan for their conservation. And today I'd like to show you some of the artefacts that we work with um, and how their stories can shed light on how the men lived at the British Antarctic Territories bases in the 1940s and 50s. So this is a, a map, a modern map of the British Antarctic Territories. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with this, uh, but I'll just point out that we have the Antarctic Peninsula that heads out in the leftmost direction there. And you can see it says Graham Land kind of curving around, and that's the part of the Antarctic Peninsula that we're particularly focusing on. Uh, you can just see next to Graham Land also Rothera, and that's obviously a modern British Antarctic survey base that's operational to this day. So the history of the historic huts in the British Antarctic Territory starts with Operation Tabarin in 1943 to 46. And Operation Tabarin was significant because it was the first government funded expedition to Antarctica. All the previous ones, Scots and Shackleton's and the others that one has heard of, were actually privately funded. Um, but this wartime expedition happened really because there was a, a starting to be a kind of escalating um, tension about territorial claims in the area. So there was a background of claims from Germany, Argentina, Chile and Britain in the Antarctic Peninsula because it was really a very um, resource rich area and particularly of um, interest was whaling. Um, whaling uh, produced oil which was actually a really important food source. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century. It's hard to believe it now, but that was what it was. And during the war, there were also lots of sort of unknown places where you could hide and um, perhaps launch sal uh, sallies against convoys um, and so on, or hide raiders and U-boats there. So there were various things about it that were made it attractive to people. 
1941, the Germans uh, captured 14 whaling vessels and uh, requisitioned 23,000 tons of whale oil, uh, which was quite a blow during wartime Britain. And in return, Britain had uh, started introducing whaling licensing from their territories, and that made the Argentinians anxious. And so there started to be a sort of tit for tat placing of flags. So the Argentinians would come and place a flag and say, this area is ours. And then the Brits would come and go and take a flag out and say, no, it's ours. And this kind of went on uh, in 1942 to three. And so the Brits were very keen to establish some permanent bases in the area that would assert their, their claim without actually creating a direct confrontation. So Operation Tabrin was a very discreet little expedition. Uh, it was only two ships. It was led by this chap who you see on the top right. His name was James Marr. James Marr was actually a boy scout on Shackleton's last expedition, the, the quest expedition of 20 to 22, which is where Shackleton famously died. Um, and so there is a real continuity between Operation Tabarin and that heroic age of exploration, which I think is rather lovely. Um, so Marr set out with just a, a small number of men and between 1944 and 1946, they established the first permanent bases in the Antarctic Territory. Uh, that includes Port Lockroy, which became Base A, and there were also bases at Hope Bay and Deception. So in 1945, at the end of the war, the uh, Operation Tabarin was renamed the Falklands Islands Dependency Survey, which we all call BIDS for short, um, and that was managed by the Colonial Office. And they refocused their mission um, to more peaceful aims, and they wanted to continue the scientific and mapping work that had happened uh, during the heroic age and also during that early stage of exploration. And so the FIDs continued to build bases, and by 1962, there were 19 bases and three refuges in the British Antarctic Territory. In 1962, FIDs became the British Antarctic Survey, or BAS as we know them, and the bases actually still belong to them. Um, and gradually, as the area was mapped, they fell into disuse and they were abandoned. Some of them were destroyed by fire or they just collapsed. Um, and occasionally they were used as temporary camps by visitors or researchers. And under the 1992 Antarctic Treaty Protocol, uh, there was a real focus on keeping the Antarctic environment as pristine and pos as possible. And that started a campaign of clearing up the bases that had um, sort of started to fall apart. And uh, so in 1994, they had a conservation and significance survey of all of the remains of all of the bases that there were. And based on that, they designated four of them as historic sites and monuments. So that was uh, Port Lockroy, Wordy House, Stonnington and Horseshoe. And in 2009, they did, um, actually designated further two, and they were Detai and Damoy. So those are the six properties that are managed as historic sites excuse me, uh, by UKHT to this day. They've been managed by them since 1993. And so this is a map of where they are. This is possibly what Antarctica will look like when all the ice is melted, because there's no ice in this picture. It's just the mountains. Um, but you can see these are the area, These are the sites of all the different ones. I'll kind of work down from the top. So the topmost one. Uh, it's only one dot, but it represents two sites, which are Damoy and Port Lockroy, very close together. And that's probably the one that if any of you have been, you will have seen that. Uh, the next one down is Wordy House. Again, sometimes visited, but not anywhere near as often. The next one down after that is Detai, which is very remote and difficult to get to. The weather often stops people from getting to it, so very few people get to see it. The one below that is Horseshoe Island, and then the southernmost one is Stonington Island. So today I'm going to focus on the two huts that I know best. Uh, this is Port Lockroy. Uh, that's where I spent last winter, I spent a month there with my colleague Lizzie Meek from the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust, who've been working with UKHT um, on the conservation management and uh, planning. And uh, we did a full artifact survey. So we looked at absolutely every object that is in that hut and did a catalogue of it and took photographs and also assessed the condition. And then the other uh, site that I know is Horseshoe, uh, which was base Y. This is actually a photograph from 1959. It doesn't look like that anymore. The paint is all worn off it. Um, but uh, Horseshoe, I did exactly the same, but on my own in 2017. Um, so when people think about Antarctic exploration, this is the kind of thing they tend to think about. They think about you know, sledge journeys and dogs and camps and things like that. Um, and certainly it's true that during the sledging season, the men from these bases spent a large amount of their time doing this. They went out and they mapped the area, traveling by dog sledge from camp to camp. And they also carried out various other scientific work at the same time. So the staff at each of the bases were all men. Um, they were all contracted to the FIDS for two years each. Um, and they'd all already done national service 
and then they would each have had a specific trade or a skill to bring to the team. So there would always be a diesel mechanic and a radio operator, and then you might have a meteorologist, a geologist, or you know any number of other types of scientific traits to, to bring to things. Um, but when you visit the huts themselves, you see a much more domestic side to the life that they led there. And I think that the room that often gets a, a really immediate reaction from the public when they come to visit are the kitchens. So the kitchen at Port Lockery and at Horseshoe really gets people interested. They they recognise a lot. They very often talk about, oh, oh, my grandmother had something like this, and it, it really gets people engaged. So this is the kitchen at Port Lockroy. Um, on the left, you can see a shelf of, of you know, typical tinned foods that they lived on. They lived primarily on tinned and dried food. Um, and there's quite a few brands there that people still recognise, like Marmite, you can see, and Cross and Blackwell, I think Tate and Lyle's syrup is in there. Um, and the kitchen at Horseshoe is very similar. Um, all of the kitchens would have had a range cooker like this one that you can see on the right. Um, so that's a fairly standard piece of equipment in all of the um, bids huts. And uh, this would also have had, you can see on above it, there's a great big copper tank, um, which is heated by the stove. And that's for hot water. It has a nice tap on the front of it as well. And this is standard equipment in all of the kitchens. So all the men would take turns, absolutely it didn't matter what, whether they were the base leader or who they were, all of them equally took turns in cooking and cleaning, emptying the rubbish and uh, dealing with the toilet. That was called gash duty, a naval term. Um, and we're very lucky that for Horseshoe, we've actually got a diary from Derek Searle. So Derek Searle uh, went to Horseshoe in 1955 and there wasn't a hut there at all. So he was part of the team that built the hut. And then in the second year, 1956, he became the base leader. One day when he was on cooking duty, he decided that it might be a good idea to try and make a steamed pudding. And this was a bit ambitious. And what would happen was you had to make sure that what you cooked was uh, you know, popular with the other guys on the team because they weren't necessarily going to be subtle about it if they didn't like your food. But the steamed pudding went down really well. So then he was like, right, I'm going to make a jam pudding. So suddenly there's this young man making a jam pudding <laughs> and it went really, really well. And then the next two here, they're about to get their visit from the Nozzle, and the Nozzle was their supply ship that visited them once a year to bring them extra food and so forth. And he was worrying about the fact that he actually was so busy that he might not have enough time to make cheese straws for the guys who were going to come uh, from the Nozzle. And I found this really amusing that a young man of 27 years old um, was worrying about cheese straws in 1955. Um, but I think it actually says rather a lot about how important it was for these guys who had contracts to live in Antarctica for two years, spend two winters in Antarctica, um, to actually have some things that they recognised and some of those comforts that they enjoyed. And for them in the 50s, that included uh, cheese straws and jam puddings, apparently. So another really enjoyable thing to look at is the bookcases, um, because it tells you a lot about what people were interested in and uh, what they enjoyed reading. So we got a really fascinating glimpse into this when we were looking through the bookcases in Port Lockroy. Um, it's a very, very wide range of material. Some of it's very highbrow. There are 14 volumes of Proust at Port Lockroy. I think it's quite interesting. They were left behind, actually. If I, maybe I shouldn't comment on that. <laughs> the, uh, and then there are lots of paperback mysteries and cowboy novels and that kind of thing. And there's also an awful lot of magazines. And there are the kind of titles you'd expect, like Punch and John Bull magazine. There are sport titles and motoring titles. But there are also an enormous number of women's magazines. So there is Women's Own, Women's Realm, Women's Weekly, Women's Illustrated, and Women. So we were a bit mystified as to why these should have been so popular um, on an all-male base. And then we actually discovered the answer. And it is on the left-hand side, you can see this is the dance beauty number of Women, which was from October the 4th, 1958. And one of the guys at Danko Island, which was base O, had written in and his letter was published. And it said, amongst the batch of magazines that arrived here in the Antarctic recently, copies of your magazine. When I first saw these, I thought how incongruous that they should be sent to what is strictly a man's world. This is a small base with five members who have to do all their own housework and cooking, besides specifically scientific work. As reading material is always short and the infrequent arrival of mail always eagerly awaited, every scrap of literature is read avidly. Shortly after your magazines arrived, one could have seen rugged bearded explorer types poring over your beauty hints and carefully studying the recipes. We thought you might like to know that your weekly was read with interest down at the bottom of the world. Um, so in 1957, Prince Philip actually came and visited seven of the bid spaces on the Antarctic Peninsula. And he wrote, um, I was most impressed by the obvious good spirit at the bases. 
and also by the very high standard of housekeeping. <laughs> so clearly all this time reading the Women's Weekly was uh, standing in good stead. So I have to say, I think the housekeeping, there's a slightly more serious point to this. Um, it's a really important part of the ethos of the FIDS era. Because although there were the very peaceful scientific objectives, fundamentally the British permanent bases were about sovereignty. And it wasn't enough for the men just to live in Antarctica. They needed to live in a civilized way. They should be eating proper meals, keeping clean and dressing properly, and running an official government office, in other words, a post office, at all of the bases. And there were signed photos of the Prince, uh, Queen, the Queen, sorry, and Prince Philip at every base, and um, just to remind people of their patriotic duty. Um, so the emphasis on maintaining standards explains this object at Horse Stew, which I was very surprised to see, uh, the one on the left there. Um, I'm just about old enough, actually, that I had something not that different from this in one of my student accommodations. Uh, it's an electric washing machine. Um, it's probably actually easier just to wash things by hand, to be honest. But this was uh, electric. You could plug it in. And in fact, all the huts were fully electrified. They had uh, diesel motors or generators, one or more of them, um, and electric light. And it ran all the uh, lots of meteorological equipment and so on. So they were able to run this thing. Um, and there are also two mangles. Um, so one of my favourite items is also the bathtub, which is a horseshoe. Um, this is a homemade bathtub. It's actually made from two oil drums that have been welded together, uh, and it vents straight outside. So on the left-hand side, you can see a sort of slightly greenish thing and a piece of string coming down. That's actually the plug, and I've given you a close-up of it. It's made from a rather beautiful nut that's been welded into the into a hole. Uh, and then the plug is made of wood with a little piece of metal on it and it's attached with a piece of string and that vents through a pipe straight out of the wall of the building and, and outside. So if you let the water out and then went out and it was a cold day, you might find yourself just going flying on an ice skating rink. It was a bit of a case of <laughs> don't walk around that side of the building when someone's just had a bath. Um, but before this, this was put in in 1956, but before that, Derek Searle recorded in his diary that the men used to wash in a, in a sort of small tub of water, which would get cold so incredibly quickly that they had to be revived by whiskey and lime after you know, taking a bath. So you can imagine that this would have felt like great luxury because as you can see it's got a tap and that tap is connected to another one of those enormous copper tanks and with water that's heated from a different stove from the one in the lounge this time. So you can just imagine them really sort of having a nice hot soak uh, and that seems to be the reason why they uh, somebody has put a cartoon of happy pigs on the wall immediately above the bath and that's what the other part of the picture is. Um, but I think the most surprising thing that I found in Antarctica uh, at all, anywhere, was these peculiar items. This is a very strange, scruffy looking photograph. There was, these are scattered all over the floor in the attic at Horseshoe Island. And you can see there's some packing straw. And then you can see some sort of brown lumps that look like dead tea bags there. Um, but what they actually are is seed potatoes. Um, so there were several experiments in gardening uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula during the FIDS era. Because actually, when you look at it, the latitude of those huts is roughly the same as Reykjavik. So in principle, you think you should be able to grow things there. Um, and so the botanist Ivan Mackenzie Lamb, who was one of the original Operation Tabarin team, actually tried to establish a garden at Port Lockroy in 1945. Um, and he it's imported a lot of soil from the Falkland Islands and also lots of seeds and things and tried to plant them. But unfortunately, what it turned out was the climate was incredibly dry and short of watering it constantly, which they couldn't really keep up with. Um, everything just died and then the soil all blew away because there were no roots to hold it there. So when you go now, you can't see any traces of this thing. Um, but they obviously also looked at them trying to have um, plants in pots and they did have some success with that. So this is a photograph of Derek Searle. We've been hearing a bit from his diary. This is him uh, cutting lettuces in Austria. I really like this photograph. I think it's rather beautiful. Um, so they must have been a very welcome addition to the diet because mostly they were eating the dried and tin food that we saw earlier. Um, and of course, at Port Lockroy this uh, year, we found an invoice from Sutton Seeds, still a company that you might have bought seeds from yourselves. Um, and they were buying press, lettuce, mustard, radishes, and spring onions, all of which you can grow very happily in a pot. Um, but I'm interested that they also were growing daffodils, snowdrops, hyacinths, and crocuses. Uh, and then we found in the archive, there's a photograph of them very successfully having got the daffodils to flower. <laughs> They planted them in these enamel, I don't know what they are, I think they're either baking trays or they might be uh, photographic developer trays. So on the right hand side we actually found one of those trays in the dark room um, and we know it's one of those because it's got a very specifically drilled hole in one corner which they would have done in order to get the drainage. Um, 
And I suppose it's hard to see why you would bother planting bulbs because you can't eat them other than exactly the same reason we plant them today, which is to cheer yourself up in the spring after a long, hard winter. So um, radio communications are incredibly important um, at the bases, um, particularly through Port Stanley. And so there's a dedicated radio room both at Port Lockroy and at Horseshoe. Um, the radio operator would send um, lots and lots of scientific results, particularly meteorological results, through um, and kept in touch with the FITS commanders as well. But he would also send um, messages to people's loved ones. And, and what would happen would be men would write out what they wanted to have sent, and then that would be radioed through by the radio operator. There's an example on the left here. Uh, it says, uh, the sun should be back in another month. A dog who escaped during the evacuation of W, that's base W, arrived here last week looking very fat and pleased with himself. Regards to uncle, love Malcolm. Um, and that was sent, <laughs> according to this, via the Z8 radio on the 27th of June, 1959. So we found quite a few bundles of these at Horseshoe. There are probably about 100 messages or 200 messages or so at Horseshoe. But at Port Lockroy, there are over 3,000 of these. Um, and I think it would be a fantastic project to digitize them, actually. Um, paper material at, uh, in the Antarctic, and you'll hear more about this, I think, from the others, is you know, it's quite a vulnerable material and they won't do brilliantly forever. So to capture that information, preserve it and make it accessible to other people, it would be fantastic to digitize it. And then we could add it to the rest of, the, of that enriching knowledge that we have about the objects in these huts. So we've talked about baking and we talked about bulbs, um, but what about the beastie? Well, this is the beastie. Um, I think I've mentioned that the FIDS were doing um, lots of scientific work, including geology, botany and zoology when they had the chance. Um, but Port Lockroy was not a sledging base. And so the main piece of scientific work that they were doing was ionospherics, which is the study of the ionosphere. So the hut at Port Lockroy has a dedicated lab uh, for ionospherics. And it had a state-of-the-art um, Union Radio Mark II ionosonde, and this is what you can see on the left-hand side there. Um, it was wired into the ceiling, and then above that, is in, on the roof, was an aerial. Um, and the way it worked, and in 1982, I'll tell you what was, how it was described. Alan Roger described it as an ungainly, slightly untidy collection of thousands of resistors, hundreds of capacitors, tens of thermionic valves, relays and switches, and three bicycle chains. And it, there really are three bicycle chains in it. Um, but it was actually a state-of-the-art piece of equipment because it allowed you to do automated um, sending of radio signals into the atmosphere uh, on a frequent basis. And so every 15 minutes, it would send out four minutes worth of radio waves into the ionosphere. So the ionosphere is basically the area of the atmosphere that's between 70 and 700 kilometers above the Earth. Um, and this works in a rather similar way to sonar. So where sonar, you send sound waves down through the sea and then you can use that reflection time it takes for them to bounce back up to the ship to tell you how deep the water is at any given point. This works in a very similar principle where you send radio waves up into the atmosphere and then, and then record how long it takes them to get back. And on that basis, you can characterize different layers in the ionosphere, um, which uh, is characterized by lots of gases that have been partially ionized by solar radiation. And the reason why the ionosphere was interesting to people is because you can use it to um, amplify long range radio communication. So in the days before satellites and all the things that we rely on now completely, um, you could send very long range radio messages using the ionosphere and sending that data out. Uh, the data was collected every month and sent to 70 different radio research stations around the world. And that was done continuously for a 30 year period from Antarctica. So it was pretty significant stuff at the time. Um, but the reason it was called the Beastie was because it was firing off every 15 minutes for four minutes at a time. And while it was doing that, no other radio signals could get through. You couldn't send or receive messages through the radio room. But also, if you were trying to listen to the World Service and you had a play on or you wanted to know the scores, you know, West Bromwich Albion versus whoever, it, you weren't going to get any of that. It wasn't going to happen. And so it was called the Beastie because of that. And the people who operated were known as the Beastie Men. So uh, the first beast came to Port Lockroy in 1953. Um, and then when Port Lockroy was decommissioned as a base in 1962, the, the Ionosonde was sent to Halley Bay, which is now famous as the one that every now and again gets closed. But the original Halley bases were actually on top of the glacier and then they got snowed up very quickly and ended up under the, under the ice. And so that machine eventually got crushed by ice and was lost. Um, so the current machine that you see at Port Lockroy was actually um, discovered by Alan Carroll, who had been a beastie man himself. And uh, he, I think he located it, I, 
Miller might know the answer to this, but I think it was in a field in Lincolnshire or somewhere, and uh, he, he <laughs> um, found it, brought it, nursed it back to health and so forth and restored it. And he installed it here at Port Lockroy, so here, not there, what am I saying? At Port Lockroy, um, but with Perspex panels on the side so you can see how it's supposed to work. But the picture on the right hand side shows uh, the same machine um, at uh, the Argentine islands that was still working in 1975. And they, in fact, it had metal panels and they would quite often be decorated by the Beastie Men. So I'm hoping that this sort of whistle top tour of, tour of artifacts at the UKHT sites has given you a bit of a taste of how the objects can really bring uh, the stories of these people to life um, and, uh, and give you a real sense of the atmosphere of the FIDS era. Um, we're incredibly fortunate that we have diaries and face reports, radio messages, accounts and invoices, and all of those things, many of them held in the archives at Bass. Um, and all of these add depth to our understanding and knowledge of this era. And we've also been incredibly lucky to be able to talk directly to some of the former FID staff about things that we find at the sites and be able to learn from what they tell us. Um, so I'm someone who's worked a lot on objects that are much, much older than this, and particularly or Egyptian material, for example, ancient Egyptian material. And I can tell you now, it's a really rare privilege to be able to talk to people who were using the objects that you're working on. And we certainly should make the most of that opportunity. So it's appropriate for me, I think, to finish off with this, which is one of my favourite pictures from the FIDS era. Um, it was sent by Jim Franks, who uh, worked at Horseshoe between 1958 and 59. Uh, he sent it to UKHT just after we'd finished our, our field season there at Horseshoe. And it shows Jim himself um, relaxing. He's got, got the best bunk in the house and a nice bowl, uh, bowl of tulips next to him. And it's a lovely sunny day, relaxing away. So I'd just like to say thank you. There are enormous numbers of people who support the work that we do. Uh, and yeah, none of it could happen without them. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you for Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Wonderful. Um, and now uh, we're going over to Sarah Lurcock, who is the director of South Georgia Museum. Thank you, Alison. Uh, can you just confirm for me you can see that screen, please? Thank you very much. I uh, was listening to Sophie talking and uh, I just was so taken by how many echoes there are between the two worlds that we're representing that are actually really very different worlds. And I picked up on so many little cues there about people uh, trying to grow things, about James Ma, who's one of my great heroes from South Georgia, about the importance of food, so many things. And I also just love that final um, comment really there about uh, trying to bring things to life. And that's very much uh, a theme, I think, through what I wanted to share with you tonight. Now, not all of you um, here will, will know um, where South Georgia is. Uh, so many more of you might have rather bypassed us than headed straight on down to the Antarctic Peninsula, but we are close by. So uh, just having a little look here, uh, thanks to Google Earth, we're in that Scotia arc there. Uh, there's the island of South Georgia, and it is around 100 miles long. And on that northern coast there uh, is where the only centre of population is. And that's here at King Edward Point. Um, it's right in the centre of uh, the island on the northwest coast. It's uh, the home for, in the foreground here, uh, King Edward Point. This is where the government and science personnel currently live. And then you see in the distance around the other side of the cove with the only bit of track uh, on the whole island, pretty much a one kilometre rough old track leading round to the old whaling station there uh, at Gritviken. And to the right, you might just see there the red roof of the museum, which is housed in the old uh, whaling manager's villa, uh, uh, villa. Everyone arriving at uh, South Georgia has had to come by sea. So if you're lucky with the weather, you might have enjoyed uh, fantastic views as you come down. This is really quite the most extraordinary island. It's been described as mountains rising straight out of the sea. Um, 
So they may even have visited some of our, our major um, wildlife sites on the island uh, here, for instance, at St Andrews before they then pull in and all the ships do come in eventually to Grit Viken. I've done this journey some 20 or more times and I am struck every single time how you're seeing yourself coming down on the chart on the ship's bridge and you realise that Grit Viken is a pinprick uh, on the island. And yet I am so aware now, having done this a few times, how quickly that little pinprick just becomes your world because we're there for six months at a time. Now, if you are coming to Grit Viken, for many people, the highlight, the draw is going to be the grave of Sir Ernest Shackleton, the great explorer, which is in Grit Viken Cemetery. And as for that whaling station, well, I think people come, they know it is a whaling station because they've been told about it by the staff on the cruise ships before they get there. But I do think, you know, without knowing more about it, it is probably just a bit of a junkyard that they're walking through on their way to reach the museum and the post office. Um, so I think sometimes the more imaginative amongst them might somehow sense some ghosts of the past but I don't think it's easy for them perhaps to really understand what the site's all about. The museum itself, um, it actually belongs to the government of South Georgia and the collection too, and it's uh, run for them by the South Georgia Heritage Trust. And its first inception um, came about because Nigel Bonner, he was um, an ex-sealing ex inspector from the island. And he realized that, you know, there was a lot of whaling ephemera in the whaling stations on the island, but it was disappearing. People were souveniring and they were taking the, the precious metals um, for their, their metal value. And so if nothing was done, this heritage and the, the evidence of this huge industry was just disappearing. And so he um, helped with others to start the museum. Um, and it's that first um, iteration of the museum, it was all about whaling. Now I wanted to share with you too this, this little quote I've got up at the top here, because uh, Nigel noticed even in those first seasons where really they had very few visitors, that actually those visitors to the museum had very little time. Uh, Grit Viken's a big site. And there's quite a lot to see with the church and the cemetery and the station and the museum. And so he realized that uh, the displays within the museum needed to be um, clear, uh, easily explained, and, and you should be able to absorb them really quite quickly. And that's still very much the case today. So the museum opened in 1992, but it's developed a good deal from those days. Um, with a succession of different people running the museum. It's been slowly changed into a museum representing all things about South Georgia and to some extent the South Sandwich Islands, which is part of the same territory. So now you'll see um, the natural history, um, you'll see about the discovery of the island and early exploration and mapping about the current science, the natural history. And of course, uh, we also, tell the story of uh, Shackleton and of course his, his um, story is very very attached to the island uh, through both the Endurance Expedition and the last one the Quest Expedition. But just as the museum grew and uh, was, was representing more the whaling station itself was being diminished. Um, these old stations were full of pollutants and uh, so it was decided that a major cleanup was needed, and this was undertaken in 2003-04. And you might be able to see here how actually what was left really was nothing much like the town that it had looked before. The chimneys went, a lot of the buildings went, just leaving foundations. And what was left was the machinery inside those buildings. So really uh, even more difficult for our visitors to understand. So we began to wonder how we could make it more accessible to the people coming. Um, one of the early iterations of that was to have these super signs. There's a whole trail of them through the whaling station 
uh, showing people what they're looking at, what it used to do, and it, it'll lead you through the story of the station. I do see people uh, interacting with those um, and learning from them. They like to take their own time to do that. But a lot of people pass those by too. So for me, uh, it seemed really obvious that we needed to add a little drama. And the way to do that, of course, is through guided tours. It is, in my view, it's a performance when you do these tours. Uh, here you see Lorna stood in the foundations of what used to be the main kitchen at Grit Vicken. And she is telling these people how many men lived in the building behind her. You know, there was 150 men living in there and about, uh, you know, what it was like with the cooking and how important the food was to the whalers. Um, through these uh, tours, then, we really want to tell the story of the 400 men that would have been working. And we want to try to evoke uh, some of the sense of what the whaling station might have been like. We want by um, talking to them about it, for them to get a sense of the terrible smell of the place, the noise, the steam, the stench, uh, the just the rot and detritus uh, throughout the area. And of course, we also want them to understand that, you know, with such an enormous industry and many stations around the island, what the effect of this was on the environment. And so we do also talk about the devastation of the whale stocks in the in the seas and, and how eventually of course that led to the stations closing in the mid 1960s. Well we are on a subantarctic island and so when we're doing those tours uh, we're often challenged by the weather. Uh, we're trying to sneak our groups of people into areas where we, they might get a little bit of lee from one of the structures in the station uh, we are famed for what are called the willy wars in the top right hand side there. You see one of these little screaming winds piling into King Edward Cove and when they hit you know about it. And of course sometimes the weather is severe enough that some of our visitors never reach us. They simply, it isn't safe for them to land. Uh, if they've got time they might manage again the next day but uh, sometimes it just can't happen. Uh, and of course, you know, as we arrive back to the island, normally we'd be getting there about this time of year, a little bit later, and uh, in a big snow winter, then there's still plenty of snow around well into summer. In fact, uh, I do remember a time when we skied to the church on Christmas Day. That's right in the middle of summertime after a big snow year. And that, that can be quite challenging logistically because at the beginning of the season, you're trying to get everything that you need over into that museum. And the logistics and the challenges of, of running a place at the end of the supply chain uh, that can only be reached by sea, most of our stuff coming from the UK, it's very similar to what the whalers themselves had to deal with. And of course, you need to order everything in very good time. Uh, we're ordering months in advance. Uh, if it's not there for the start of the season, you might have a chance to reorder something. You can't nip round the corner there to the DIY shop. Uh, but the chances are, even if you order it just as you arrive, it won't arrive on the island until uh, you have actually reached the end of the season. Now, with that museum uh, being inside uh, the heritage building, uh, it is actually unheated. We're often working in the museum in padded overalls. Um, it's really cold, so we, we all have thermals. Um, and of course, that means for the artifacts that are stored within the museum, there are uh, additional challenges uh, with an, an environment that changes just as quickly as the outside uh, environment changes. So we want to keep um, the artifacts safe, and, and that's a large part of what our curator is doing, uh, assessing the condition of our collection and making sure it's in the best conditions that we can provide. And I've just added this little graph here. We have these little tags that measure temperature and humidity. And this is a comparison trial between two different types of cases. The lower two lines, the blue and the black lines there, are measuring the temperature within a, a sealed case and a, a case that, that has just been built into the museum. Um, and so our most precious artifacts need to be in these environmentally um, controlled 
sealed cases. And if you look at the red line right at the top, that is the same line over time inside that sealed case. It's really very good. It shows very little change in uh, relative humidity, whereas the green line beneath it is, is what's happening inside the unsealed case. So this is the sort of way that we can help to preserve um, what the things within the museum and try to keep them at their very best. So in the years um, since the museum started, the tourism industry has really built. And we used to have um, mostly a, an English speaking audience. Um, the very first tourists were mainly the Americans. But boy, that has really changed, especially in recent years. We now have operators. So you see this ship here. This is one of the Ponon vessels. They're French. Um, so we get more French visitors. We have another company visit regularly called Hapag Lloyd, and they're German. And you can see possibly from this pie chart borrowed from one of the government um, uh, re um, reports that now um, I would say almost 50% of our visitors are no longer English speaking as a first language. So how do we reach them? Well, we have various methods of doing this and uh, we're really, really grateful to work with the translators on board these vessels. They're often multi languages on board the vessels themselves. And so they have excellent translators working with them. So going out on those tours at times, uh, we might be being translated into three different languages uh, while we're doing a, a guided tour. Sometimes that's with the help of, of um, more technical stuff. Uh, so they have things like the whisper system, um, head phones uh, so that people can be translating at the same time as we're speaking. Um, but often it's actually just people in little gathered uh, groups around us all having translations into different languages. And then once they're within the museum, we've tried to make the, the museum objects, the highlights of the museum more available by having uh, the highlights translated into a number of different languages as well. But we are aware that most people won't ever visit South Georgia. So how to make the museum available to all those people. This is a long held uh, plan. And actually um, the current situation we find ourselves in being unable to return to the island has really helped with this because we've had a little more time and we've been able to make real progress um, towards our new South Georgia Museum website. And uh, tonight is actually the first official announcement of this website and we are um, we're still working on it, but we're quite pleased with the result and we really hope it's going to help people to access uh, the museum and its collection. So we're going to have um, various features on the website that are going to um, bring it back to people's attention quite regularly uh, by, for instance, having an object of the month and we'll put that out on our Facebook and so on. Um, we've also got an Insta account so people can, can access us that way. Um, we have a collection of um, highlights. It's very easy for people just to have a very quick look at the website and see the very best things. Or uh, it's also easy to go in there and search deeper uh, in the collection. This website's going to develop. Uh, it's got a few fun features as well. Uh, and we've got um, plans to do more there. So when uh, you have a, an extra hour in the next few days, do come across to the museum website. Uh, and hopefully uh, you'll find out a lot more about our museum. So to get back to the title of the talk tonight, you know, why? Why do we tell the whaler's tale? For me, it's always been about trying to put the men back into the station. I always say that. Uh, I want to try to evoke um, the lives of the thousands of different men. And it was a very masculine world. They spent months, some of them spent years at the end, uh, other end of the world from where they normally lived. Uh, and of course, you know, it was a bloody but lucrative trade. But there's more to it than that, telling this story. And I'm gonna take you to a conversation that we had. Um, we were stood on the front steps of the museum one day and a lady came up the stairs and sort of asked us quite angrily, 
you know, what, why all this industrial rubbish just allowed to remain on this fantastic island and why wasn't it all being cleared away, you know, this, this was awful. So I spent a little while talking to her and I, I mentioned about how, you know, actually when you look on a map, the, the whaling stations are just a pinprick, they are a tiny amount of space taken up on a large island. And when you get into those stations and you see the sheer extent of them, it helps our visitors and the wider world, I hope, to understand the sheer scale of what happened there. Uh, you know, the persistence of this hunt uh, that went on for 60 years on the island and the upshot of that, which was the near extinction of some of these whale species in our waters. And if you don't have any evidence of that left, is it all too easy just to brush that story under the carpet and almost pretend it never happened? And I'd like to think that after we'd spoken for a while that she conceded the point. Now, what I didn't do was go on and tell her, because I don't think I'd have won this one, that for me, I actually see real beauty in these heritage sites. It's always excited me. I think it's because I was brought up in the shadow of Digcot power stations with those fantastic cooling towers. And so I have always loved this rusting, red, stunning environment. Uh, I also love to walk away from it and disappear up into the mountains and the hills. But I don't know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure now that I'm not the only one that sees the world this way, because uh, I think if there weren't others who felt the same, then we wouldn't have, for instance, here in the UK, the UNESCO sites in Cornwall and West Devon mining landscapes, also the Derwent Valley, Valley Mills in Derbyshire, the Big Pit Museum in Wales. Um, there is beauty and there's lessons to be learned from these sites. So the whaling station at Gritviken, the other whaling stations, and of course the museum there at Gritviken, we're there to inform people. We're helping to acknowledge uh, a controversial history of the island. And we hope that when our visitors leave this site, they uh, not only understand that story better, but perhaps also they contrast that with the more positive changes that they may have heard about and seen on the island. Now, there's another whole story uh, here. It'll have to go for another night, but the habitat restoration projects that have been going on on this island have made real differences. And the government's uh, good management of the modern day fisheries and the tourism, this is a really positive message. And the benefits of getting this, getting this right um, are underlined, I think, by the evidence of seeing what happens when you get it wrong. Now, as Sophie was saying, uh, we should really be packing right now and heading south uh, once more to open the museum, but that's just can't happen this year. But I'm glad to say that through the portal of the new museum website, whilst the museum doors are not currently open, the museum still very much is. So you come and visit us soon, you see the website details there. And thank you very much for having me talk tonight. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. And now it's over to our final speaker, who is Jeff. OK, can everybody see my screen? Okay, excellent. Right, my name's Jeff Cooper. I'm the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust Heritage Programme Manager. I'm a conservation carpenter by trade. I've spent two seasons working in the Ross Sea with the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust and three years now with the, the UK Trust. And I'd like to share with you and give you an insight some of the challenges which we, we have to work with both off, se off season when we're in the UK as well as on site in Antarctica. As Sophie mentioned, we look after six sites, ex bass FID sites, and they range over 250 miles or 400 kilometres of the Antarctic Peninsula, and we experience a number of different climates. So we have a very wet climate up at Port Lockroy, the northern sites, 
Whereas down at Stonington, the most southerly of our sites, you can experience what was called the fumigator, which was a catabatic wind which comes off the northeast glacier, and you can have winds up to 150 kilometres an hour. So, so that's a bit of a challenge to be working out in. And we have difficulty of access issues with sea ice. The site at Detai is often iced in, and unfortunately, we can't often get to that site. And the further south you go, the less ships are also available to, to transport us and, and, and to come and visit. As I say, we look after six sites which cover the period from Tabarin, which is from February 1944 at Port Lockroy in the top left, which is established there to put a British presence on the Antarctic Peninsula. Werby House, top right, was built in the, the later part of the 1940s and Horseshoe Island, Detai. These were examples of prefabricated buildings built by Bolton and Paul with various extensions added to them during the base is life and as the base has evolved. We have Stonington Island at the bottom, which was the second of the British sites on the island, which was built, started in 1960s. And the bottom right one is Demoy Hut, which was built in the 1970s. The bases are largely left as they were when the bases were closed, but Port Lockroy was, was extensively rebuilt by Bass in the 1996, after the surveys to assess the significance of the site. It's important to conserve these sites. I think we, we've heard th this evening about that. It's not just the buildings themselves, but the contained artifacts as described by Sophie, but also the associated stories of science and exploration, but for both our current and, and the future generations. So like I say, I'd like to share with you some of the, the challenges that we deal with. And this is some of my off season work. Historic research is vital in developing a conservation program for, for these huts, rather than just running an ad hoc maintenance program. We must understand how the bases were constructed originally and how they've changed and during their operation and identify when these changes happened. The Bass Archive is the most fantastic resource for this, containing the base diaries, general reports, if we're lucky, construction reports, mechanical reports, they also have an extensive photographic library and also a film archive occasionally for some of the sites. So you can actually get, get some movie footage of, of the sites. Absolutely amazing resource. So we have things like the, the original Tabarin reports. We've got the Tabarin based diaries, the general reports, as I say, and the, these photographs. And please remember that the floor plan that you see at the top of the photograph of uh, the slides of Wordy House. We'll come back to that later. Sorry. Also phenomenally lucky to actually have contact with some of the FIDs and people that actually lived in these bases and operated in the bases, as Sophie mentioned earlier, and to capture that knowledge and first-hand accounts of, of life in the bases, which is an absolutely amazing resource to, to understand the bases and how they operated these changes. One of the things that I do is establish the lifeline of the building, uh, and by doing so, you can like I say we can track these changes. My research in this photograph is from the Bolton and Poole archive, which is in Norwich. And they have photographs of some of the buildings which were built for Bass at the time. And this is the generator shed at Port Lockroy, which some of you may know as where the shop is. And so this is how the building was originally constructed in the Bolton and Poole's workshop. And this is how they planned for it to be constructed. Through contact with David Price, one of the FIDs who, who was on stationed at Port Lockroy, he actually built the generator shed. So he took the panels, which were shipped down from the UK, and he then turned them into the building that we see today. And we have a construction report, luckily for all that, and extensive photographic evidence of how the building was actually built, which isn't necessarily always as the building was intended to be built and that the building walls ended up being slightly longer on one side than the other and had to be adapted for various reasons. So we can, we can learn from these photographs and we can compare them to how the base is today. And again, we, we can look and track these changes. Another big part of my job, which happens on site as well as here in the UK, is picking apart history. And in some ways we're doing an historic building 
crime scene situation. We're actually investigating the buildings, picking them apart, trying to understand how they are. This photograph is at Stonington Island and in the foreground we have the British, British base that, and in the background you can just make out over the top of the roof is an American base. So we actually have a complexity of a British site and an American site. And halfway between the two bases, there is what's termed the emergency store. And if you look at the timbers in there, they're stamped with American stamps, so stencil. So it looks like it was an American building. But through research and looking in the archive at Bass, we've established that the ba that building was actually a British building built by salvaging materials from the American base. And so you have to understand the use of the buildings and how they were built. And that's a, a hybrid, really, of British use and American materials. If you look in the published records, we have Port Lockroy as originally constructed in the top left hand corner. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have Wordy House, which was built in 1947. The published account says that the front portion, which is where the now lounge and the Arnospherics room is, but it was originally the mess room and the bunk rooms, was removed in early 1947 and taken down to build Wordy House. However, if you actually look at the building and all the two buildings, the materials don't actually match at all. The windows are different, the actual materials used to construct the bases are actually different. And so something didn't quite add up here. So I continued doing more research and unfortunately I think I managed to find the one, one diary which doesn't exist in the Bass archive, which was the early Wordy House based diary. So we didn't have the information from that. But through researching Stonington, I found this photograph at the bottom, which is the one and only photograph of the construction of Wordy House. And the actual main base is the part that's being constructed in the foreground where, where the men are. And you can see there's a building in the background. And it's like, so what's that building? Through contact with the Bass Club, I found this gentleman whose name is Gordon Stock. And he was one of the three who originally built Wordy House. And so don't necessarily believe what you read, but certainly believe what you hear. So Gordon came in to visit us and we looked through the, the archive. We looked at the old photographs and he informed me that no, that the Wordy House was not constructed from the front of Port Lockroy. Certain components were like the flagpole and we'll come back to look at the flagpole you can see in both photographs, but the building itself was actually salvaged from Deception Island and brought down. And, and constructed then. But that building we can see in the bottom photograph was the generator shed and that was the first part that was built. Gordon was one of the first three that was there and he told me of living in the packing tray that the engine that was that came down to Wordy House was that powered the radio sets and he actually lived in the packing case for a month while they built the house then had somewhere to live. He also told me stories about being saved from a crevasse fall by one of the dogs that he trained. And so you can see preserving these stories and is as important, if not more so, than the actual buildings and the artifacts themselves. And so talking to, to people like Gordon, it, it makes you realise that a heroic era actually continued through, through to the, into the Operation Tabarin and into the FIDS era. All these activities that, that they did were, were quite heroic in their own right. Also, you can often believe what you can see. So on the right hand side, we have two pictures of the same part of a building. One, the top one's from 1952, and the bottom is from this last season in early 2000, uh, 2020. And you can see that the building's largely changed, but through having the historic photographs, you can actually walk around the building and look for the witness marks of where the screws were for these shelves and for the speaker that's on the wall and you can still find them and you can still see them so you can make the direct link between what you can observe now and the historic photographs and actually date when changes happened. On the left hand side this is looking up inside the roof of Port Lockroy and roofs are always the most fantastic place to, to go and pick apart a building and understand them and you can see on the left hand side the original Bolton and Paul part of, of, of Bransfield House 
And then on the right hand side, you've got the original extension, which they built again from Deception Salvage Timbers with a canvas roof, which is always recorded in the diaries as often leaking. And you can still actually see evidence of all these components within the building. So it's very important to, to look around and read the buildings and learn about every single stage of the construction. And if you look hard enough, you can find all these different stages. However, sometimes you can't always believe what you read or see. So you, you, you do need to, to marry up the, the history from, from the Bass archive and the written accounts and from the observed accounts from talking to the men. So the top left-hand photograph is the radio room in Port Lockroy. And it looks very similar to the radio room now, but if you actually look in more detail and you can see the photographs from 1944, this is the original radio room, which is now actually half in the larder. And you can still see the, again, the witness marks, the screw holes for the speaker at the top and the little electrical mounting points around the wall. So again, a keen observation and looking for the knots on, in the timbers and the screw holes, you can actually identify where things were and where, how the buildings had changed and things have moved. Things like the toilet at Port Lockroy has had changes through the bass restoration and conservation work they did in the 1990s through to the current day. And I mentioned that the Wordy House red flag the flag was always on the back of the generator shed so that the, the flagpole you see there isn't where the original flag was that that's actually was a wind generator so that that gave them lights in, in the building so again you have to not take for, for granted everything you see you need to do that forensic analysis of the building and marry up what you see with the history both, both written and verbal and capturing that that first-hand experience from the, from the FIDs and the the vast personnel that lived and worked in these huts is the most critical thing at the moment. So that's some of the components of my UK work. And I'd like to now come on to some of the field logistics. So this is the flip side of the coin. As I say, we, we look after these six sites, many of them in remote locations. And we have a challenge of getting the staff there, the food there, the, the camp itself, and building materials and all the rest of it and transporting it. We have fantastic support from IATO and the IATO fleet and from the Royal Navy. And you can see HMS Protector at the top there, that they've helped us to, to move the very large amount of materials we often take to site, something like up to six tons. We have a single opportunity to do this each year. So there's a lot of planning go goes into all this to make sure that we have everything we need for all the planned tasks that we need to do and we can't nip to the hardware shop, as was mentioned earlier. So it's so critical to, to evaluate what tasks you're going to be doing and take everything with you. And as you can see at the bottom, some things haven't changed into the modern era. Moving materials around on site is almost identical. One's almost a colorized version of the original photograph. So it still comes down to moving things around by hand. Actually working and living down in Antarctica, when we're up at sites like Port Lockroy, we're lucky in that we have the Nissen hut to, to live in. Some of you may have seen that. And that is comparative luxury co compared to many of the other sites. Working at Wordy House, we're very lucky that the Ukrainian base, Bernadsky, is on what used to be the Faraday site, which is on the neighboring island. And we have had fantastic support from them this last season in surveying the site there. However, when we look to the southern sites, so Detai, Horseshoe and Stonington, we are in the realm of field camps. And so we, we are living and working on the islands and always in tented accommodation. We, we don't stay in the historic buildings themselves at all. We respect them and we, we live in camps. And the camps bring their own challenges. As I say, transport is a, is a big challenge to these southern sites. You get a, a lot less ships come down to, to the southern area and to the Marguerite Bay. And so getting materials, we infrequently see people and we are largely reliant on, on those ships for giving us things like washing facilities. And so at the southern sites, we, we can often be out in the field for several weeks between the opportunity of having a wash. Accommodation is a bit more basic. So we have in the bottom left-hand corner, a communal tent, which we use for our cooking and our communications area. 
uh, and we eat in there. So, so we have a communal area and we have sleeping tents, an individual sleeping tent, which, which is your, your living space. And so, so that's where you can get away from everybody else. Otherwise you're, you're largely living out of each other's pockets. We, at the bottom, you can see Michael that there, he's digging out Port Lockroy and you can just see the top of the window. So we, we're out in days that are very cold, wet, windy, snowy, digging away the buildings, working very long hours in these difficult conditions. And at the end of the day, you're going back to a tent. To do the carpentry, we don't have the luxury of having a workshop to, to work in. And you can see at the, at the top that we, we lay out tarpaulins to catch all of our sawdust. And we have the materials stored outside and, and we work outside. So we're very weather dependent in our, in our work programs. As I say, we're, we're a very small team, often four or five people working long periods together. And so the selection of the team is critical. It's important to, to not have people that will just survive under these conditions. It's important to have people that will actually thrive under these conditions and, and, and enjoy the conditions and the work. So why are we actually there? What do we do when we're on site? A large component of, of what we do is surveying. So, so we're actually looking at the buildings and gathering data for the writing of the conservation management plans and the implementation plans. And in doing so, we're often looking at the condition of the building, looking for what's wrong, what, what needs repairing. And so then through historical research, we can see how was it built originally, what materials were used, what types of nails and screws were used. So we actually take samples and we look and we see what type of, of nails and screws we use. And we'll use the same type. We would not use modern screws when we do the actual conservation repairs. Occasionally we find components that, that are missing, like the top left, we, we have refrigerator style door handles that we used at Stonington, which were actually borrowed from the American site and, and used on the British site. We look at hold downs that, that were, were there at Stonington and where they, you can see it's all corroded away. So we're looking for what components were there originally so that when we go back and do the conservation works, we can put in something that looks historically correct, but maybe have small upgrades to, to, to meet the modern requirements for, for structural engineers. So we're sampling the materials, we're sampling the fixings, we take small paint samples from the building as well. So that if we do need to do any form of redecoration on certain things like windows and doors to preserve them, we could put them to certain eras so because we know what the, exactly the paint was at that time. And that whole process will then feed into the procurement process and then the shipping. So it's a cyclical pattern. And I'd like to include some, some data that we captured this season by the Bass Magic team, their, their mapping team and survey team, they came with us and they used some 3D terrestrial laser scanning and captured these images of Worthy House. And you can see the level of detail that, that we managed to capture in the buildings is absolutely stunning. And we can use this data and refer back to historic reports. And you can remember earlier on in the talk, I mentioned the floor plan for Worthy House. So we can actually match the bottom left image, which is the floor plan as now. And we can then look how that related to the floor plan as originally used. This is from 1960 when the base T team overwintered there. These scans collect the most amazing amount of data which we can use with the architects and other professionals who can't come with us always down to Antarctica. So, but we can bring the building back to them basically and we can then interact with them and, and turn the building around on the computer, look at it in different ways. We can use it for public engagement. And the, the models are so much better than photographs. So many times you want to look at a feature and it's always just on the edge of a single photograph. On the models, you can actually turn it around and look at those components. So the most amazing thing, and I say we, we, we can true the original floor plans to what we can see now. Another component of what we do is emergency repairs because what we're trying to do is keep the building structurally sound and weather tight until we can actually come back and do the true conservation repairs which we'll, we'll do after we've written the conservation management plans, created the implementation plan and raised the funds to actually do this work, all activities that we're currently on for, for the sites. So we have a number of planned tasks that we'll be doing. So you can see this is the, actually the emergency store, the building I mentioned between the American site and the British site on Stonington Island, various panels were missing off the building and the building was full of ice. So we actually managed to find the panels that were missing, 
put them back into position and then refelted over the building so now that building is weather tight and it's structurally sound. We also do other components like repairing windows and doors. Sometimes there's broken glass there, so we'll, we'll fix those windows, we'll make sure the doors work, the hinges work so we can shut them, keep the ice and snow out. We also get involved in more complex tasks which require some specialist training, things like asbestos mitigation, which you can see on the right hand side. So potentially the flues contain asbestos and we encapsulate them so that we're not causing any more environmental damage and stabilising them while we, we plan what we're going to be doing. You can see on the left hand side the flues potentially are leaning away from the building. The, the, the perspective of the photograph looks very confusing. The scaffold tower is actually upright. <laughs> it's the flue that's leaning and so we actually tied that back to, to the building with stabilizing guys. We found a lot of ice had got into the pup pen, so which on the right hand side, so we removed all that ice carefully and within that we actually found the doors which were off all, all the individual pup pens were actually in encapsulated within the ice so carefully removing all the ice we've now got the doors back and we'll kind of reinstate them where they originally were. We also get involved in some tasks which are a bit more spur of the moment shall we say so uh, the middle photograph at the top is we found that part of the wall of East Base was falling over and, and coming out from underneath the roof so we had to devise a way of stabilizing the building to, to stop it, it falling apart using the materials that we have to hand. So again, it's quite critical to, to recruit staff that have experience and they're capable of thinking on their feet and making the best of the materials and, and items that you have to hand to solve a problem. So it's, it's quite a critical ability of people to, that we take down that they can do this problem solving and, and thinking on their feet. So that's a quick whistle stop tour. So in conclusion, I would like to say almost exactly 76 years to the day since this photograph was taken of my fellow carpenter. This is Chippy Ashton who built Port Lockroy. He's standing very proudly in front of his hut and I'd like to say thank you for your time this evening to, to listen to some of the challenges that we face in, in conserving these huts. Fantastic, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jane Pierce and I'm the curator of the South George Museum. I've been working for many years in museums now, but most of my experience is from working in museums in London, in the UK. So I'm used to commuting from home every day and spending most of my time on the museum site. Working for a remote museum such as South Georgia Museum um, has been completely different. How do we care for the collections when we're working remotely? So what happens for five or six months of the year when there's nobody there? And what problems does this present? I think I spent my first season in South Georgia this summer and today I want to give you um, a bit of an insight into my experiences firsthand, how I felt it went and what I learned from working not only in a new museum but a new completely new environment in um, a very remote environment. I also want to talk to you a little bit about what curators do and what I have to think about when looking after a collection. So, this is the museum. As you can see, it's when we first arrived, it was thick with snow, blue skies. South Georgia is very remote. The nearest neighbor is the Falklands over 800 miles away. You can't fly to South Georgia, there's no airstrip. So the journey takes a 18 hour flight from the UK to the Falklands, followed by a five, sea, five day sea journey um, to get there. So we left in early October and arrived to thick snow, as you can see from the photograph. The museum is the building on the left and on the right there's a smaller building and that was actually our accommodation. So you can see my daily commute was reduced to probably around 45 seconds. So that was kind of a treat, but very, very different from what I've experienced before. The other significant difference is the climate. The visitor season is limited to November to March every year. And within that time scale, it can go from a lovely summery feeling of day to again, snow, awful weather. So it's very, very changeable. 
South Georgia is a sub-Antarctic island. It lies within the polar front, so it can get very cold. The climate is maritime, and the average winter temperature can drop to mostly about five degrees, but can go, go as low as minus 10. And the average summer temperature typically is around eight to 10 degrees, but obviously it can go a little bit warmer. So although there's not significant changes, it does feel quite different from winter to summer. Again, this is just another photograph to show you the difference. On the top right is the New Zealand team in all of their summer plumage. We just gathered around um, Ernest Shackleton's grave there in midsummer, um, toasting the boss on what was our Christmas day on the 27th of December. And you can see exactly the same view that was taken on the 22nd of July this year um, in mid midwinter, so lots of snow on the ground. So the museum is located in an old whaling station in Griplican, and the building was once the original manager's museum, and the centre of administration in the whaling station. The image you can see here was taken in 1906. That actual building was built in Norway and shipped down to South Georgia and erected there on that site in 1906. This building unfortunately was um, destroyed in a fire, so the building was rebuilt in 1914 and is the same as the building you saw in the previous slide. Whaling ceased in South Georgia in 1964 and so the building that the museum lives in now was dormant for over 20 years before being opened in 1992 to the public. The rooms are arranged around a central entrance and they reflect all aspects of South Georgia, um, including whaling, social history, expedition exploration, natural history, and we even have information mili uh, military and maritime. So displays um, show different parts of the collection from whale barnacles to albatross eggs to beer bottles. Um, and we also have um, display of maritime material and um, you can see a replica of James Caird there. This is a replica of a whaler's bunk room taken from one of the actual original buildings and um, it's just a recreation of what we think a room would have looked like based on materials that have been found and salvaged from the area. So the curator, my job. My job is very different. Um, most curators' um, roles vary quite significantly, significantly depending on the size of the museum, the size of the collection, um, and the size of the organisation. In small museums, such as the South Georgia Museum, the curator has to multitask. So here you can see um, my work encompasses all aspects of collections care, such as cleaning and putting up shelves, um, but also including things like exhibitions work, so installing them and writing them. But also I can actually spend quite a lot of time at my desk um, working on documentation and writing labels for displays. But one of the main parts of my role is to care for the collections and manage the collections. You can see here again we're back dusting. Collections care is central to the work of any museum. The collections are obviously the most important resource for a museum. They make museums unique and without them it wouldn't exist. So caring for the collection um, makes them available to be viewed and displayed and accessible to the public and to educate and inspire. So we're trying to put the objects out on display to educate and display inspire but also to try and maintain them for future generations. We have to put the objects first otherwise the museum would cease to exist. Even when the museum is close to the public it's important that this care of the collection is continued so that we can safeguard everything, keep it um, secure and clean and safe 
so that when we do open to the public again, it's safe and things return to normal. So with that in mind, what keeps a curator awake at night? What do I worry about when it comes to collections care? As I was saying, our heritage um, is represented by a vast array of cultural material from you know, national icons to day-to-day -day social uh, materials such as you know, newspapers and our mugs we drink our tea out of. All of these things are important and tell a story um, about our history, our community, our families, our cultural heritage. And so we have to protect all these objects to be able to tell all those stories and prolong the life of our cultural heritage. So a big part of my role is to know the enemy. <laughs> and this, the enemy, if you like, are what we call agents of deterioration. So there are 10 things that we have to keep checks on to look after our objects and our collections. One of the big ones is physical forces. Physical forces are things such as impact, shock, and vibration. And often caused when we move an object, whether that's from storage to display or for research or for a loan where we have to ship it to another museum. Um, these are all things that we can prevent and make an object safe by keeping it in proper storage, packed up properly, or if it's on display, it's properly supported um, so that we can kind of minimise that physical risk, if you like. So that's normal for any museum, but in South Georgia, what I discovered was that the wildlife provide a whole extra dimension that I've never experienced before. <laughs> um, locals disrupting things, the outdoor um, objects, as you can see here, this um, small young elephant seal um, suddenly decided to take a nap against one of the old um, ship masts the wildlife is very, um, holds no bounds um, and it quite happily will come right up to the doorstep of the museum and they go wherever they like, which is quite interesting and something I've never experienced before. For example, this is two of the museum team and here they are giving um, an old ship propeller um, a lip of paint. You can see the mask in the background where the seal was using as a pillow just in the background. So here they are hard at work giving the propeller a new look of paint and yet within hours some more seals have decided to use the propeller as a little rest and a windbreak. So there's, there's no let up for those objects, they're constantly being physically manoeuvred by the uh, wildlife. Although they don't present an immediate danger, um, it is an extra factor that I've never considered before. This year we also had um, a young fur seal pup come into the museum when we weren't looking when our backs were turned and again he was quite happily exploring the museum until one of the museum team discovered him um, in, in a corner of a room. So again it's another aspect I've never realised before. Um, another item that is quite, um, can be quite a significant problem for bigger museums um, is the issue of object loss due to um, theft or vandalism. Um, luckily, in South Georgia, we don't have such a significant security risk. We do have some penguins that obviously get quite interested in the objects, but actually the risk of security is not such a major problem we have. Another major risk to museums and to any building, in fact, is the risk of fire and water damage. Again, South Georgia, it's, an old, it's a single story building, it's very um, self-contained and it's very safe, but fire and water damage is always the risk. 
we work with the government and the British Antarctic Survey staff to look at the uh, fire risks and the water damage risks. And there are measures in place to constantly check and maintain all of those um, systems. But obviously, if there was to be a fire, no one is coming to put out that fire apart from the local community. So there is a lot of training involved with all of the staff and everyone on the island, probably around 20 people understand the risks and are all trained so that it should any the worst happen, that we're all ready to, um, to deal with the problem. But as I say, the um, lots of systems are put in place to minimise that threat. Again, in most museums around the world, um, they're located in urban environments and that often comes with a level of pollution and lots of population. And with that brings pollutants and pests such as um, bugs and things like clothes moss. And so one of the really interesting uh, factors with the South Georgia Museum is that the atmosphere is very clean um, it's not urban and there's not that many people, um, no population and the visitors are, numbers are actually quite low. When I arrived in South Georgia after the museum had been shut for six months, I was quite astounded by the minimal dust that was around the museum and the displays. So actually, although they are issues, it's very, very minimal. And so one of the good things about it being in a remote environment is these two, two issues are very small. Again, another problem, um, which is actually um, easy to prevent, is pollution from light. Um, all objects um, can be affected by light. And one of the quick wins is to put blinds up, turn lights off at the end of the day and trying to reduce the exposure of objects to light. Um, in this photo you can see on a lovely beautiful sunny day the sunlight is beaming through and hitting all the objects on display. Again this can be reduced by fitting blinds and again at the end of the day making sure that everything is shut down and dark. This is one of our very special specimens. It's a very large wandering albatross and feathers and lots of other organic matter do suffer greatly from um, light exposure. So again, this specimen is kept safe by being put behind blinds so that on a day-to-day -day basis, it's kept in the dark. And so these beautiful feathers that you can see here um, don't um, go through decay. Two of the most crucial environmental parameters that a curator has to worry about are the temperature and relative humidity. We are all used to um, thinking about temperature, you know, it's especially being British, it's something we talk about all the time and discuss the weather all the time and we're less interested in generally in humidity but temperature and humidity are very closely intertwined and have a very powerful impact on objects and can drastically um, increase their deterioration so we have to be very careful about temperature and humidity and it's probably the two things that a curator worries about the most. The good news in South Georgia is that the temperatures are low, generally overall, and it's believed that for every five degrees drop in temperature, the uh, deterioration of an object or of material can be halved. So the fact that most of the year the temperatures in South Georgia are around zero to five degrees is just really great. It's, it's like having everything in deep, cool storage. And apart from a few significant materials, such as maybe plastics becoming brittle, this is actually a really good thing. 
So everyone understands about temperature, um, but what is relative humidity? If, if an environment is dry or very damp, um, you can generally feel it with your skin. Um, if you feel dry, you can feel a bit itchy and your skin feels dry. Um, and if it's very hot and humid, you feel clammy. But the feeling these extremes is not good enough to actually understand what's really happening. So for a collection to really understand the changes and what effects it's having on the collection, we really need to monitor the environment and take strict measurements. So what can happen if the relative humidity is not brilliant? So if we have too high humidity, we can get corrosion of metals and we can also get mould growing on some substrates. If the humidity is too low, um, some organic materials can shrink, um, crack and split um, as they release moisture back into the air. So this is um, an issue that we don't really want to do. So we're trying to create very stable relative humidity. So the question is, what is relative humidity? That is the, the, the big question. So this is the uh, science bit. So listen carefully now to, um, to try and hopefully I can explain it. Um, relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in a fixed volume of air relative to the, to the amount of water that could be held in the air at a given temperature. So it's expressed as a percentage. So for example, in this slide, you can see that in the middle, um, at 20 degrees C, you can see the amount of water vapor, which is blue, and the percentage of air that uh, could contain water vapor. Um, so therefore it gives us a relative humidity of 55%. If we increase the temperature to 30 degrees, then we increase the potential water vapor, vapor capacity. So that's the yellow again. So you can see that although the water vapor has stayed the same, the capacity of that air to take more weight water is much bigger. So therefore, we can see a reduction in the relative humidity, which is 28%. Again, if we decrease decrease the temperature down to 10 degrees, the, um, we increase the relative humidity and the potential for that air to hold more water is reduced. The temperature which results in a 100% relative humidity is known as the saturation point, or, or we can actually call it the dew point. And the dew point is when we would see condensation, let's say on a window or on um, a surface. And in the museum, in terms of objects um, and looking after the collections, we really want to avoid hitting that dew point and get, getting condensation on the objects or on any, any surface. As soon as we start getting water vapour on objects, that's when we start seeing problems. So how do we measure temperature and relative humidity? Um, a stable environment is the single greatest asset um, when caring for a collection. And it's really important that we take these measurements and try and get an understanding of what's happening in the building. Environmental monitoring is a term we give to this, this activity. And it's the regular measurement of not only temperature and relative humidity, but also light and trying to get a picture of, of what's going on to try and prevent issues and creating um, a sustainable environment and building, if you like. We have a variety of tools that we use. On the left in this image, you can see um, what we call a digital uh, thermohydrograph. And um, it gives us on the spot readings. So it, this can only tell us what's happening at that moment that the reading is taken. On the right, we have something called a data logger, and that regularly takes data of temperature and relative humidity 
let's say every 20 minutes of every day um, until it's full of data and then you can download it and gather data from quite a big period of time. These are really useful for data analysis and allow us to collect data even when um, we're not present. So from a remote point of view, um, the museum is closed for winter, but we're actually still collecting data. Um, and that's really, really useful to see what's happening in the museum while we're not there. Just to give you a little example of where we've got to, uh, we started this season with um, some data loggers. So we've only just started to build a picture of what's happening in the museum while we're not there. And this is a case that we're currently monitoring. It's our natural history case, and it's full of um, really um, wonderful taxidermy, skeletal matter, and we've even got um, a wet specimen there too. This room and obviously the whole building is unheated this case is not sealed either so it's very exposed and mimics actually what's happening on the outside just to give you an idea then of what's occurring and what we're starting to see with this data that we're collecting this is the data from this winter actually so you can see it's from March when we left to around um, end of August so pretty much most of the winter and what you can see here is the green line represents the humidity and the blue line represents the temperature and as we expect as the temperature is dropping it goes down to about minus four there the humidity is slowly rising and although you can see lots of wobbles, they're actually, wobbles are occurring over a day or two. And so it's quite low wobbles. And actually, um, the good news is that um, it's quite slow changes. It's not fluctuating wildly. And if you can see the black line at the bottom, that's the dew point. That's the point where the water vapor um, in the air would be 100% saturated and we'd start to get condensation problems and we're not reaching that so it's good news so it is cold it is quite humid but that's that's an artifact of being cold temperatures and we're not hitting the dew point so it's it's not such a bleak picture as I would expect and we're quite happy with that in uh, opposite to that we've got some news which is not great so in the summer when we actually first got these data loggers we were seeing quite wildly fluctuating temperatures and humidity so you can see on that previous one we had some wobbles over days but these are huge wobbles so the temperature is moving from eight degrees up to 16 degrees in the space of the day so what's happening here um something that I wouldn't expect such dramatic changes um, and we think this issue is due to visitors. So when we have a nice empty room, the temperatures and humidity are kind of corresponding to the outside and when we get visitors coming in, we get these sudden rises in temperature with lots of bodies in the space and therefore the humidity um, is dropping as the temperature is rising as we would expect but what's not great is seeing such a quick change and it's these quick changes and these big fluctuations that are potentially the headache um, for us so what we don't understand is how much that change is having an impact on the objects so when visitors come in if it's raining they've got wet coats on wet shoes on they're breathing uh, they're raising the temperature in the gallery it's getting a bit hot hot and humid. How much of a problem is this to our objects? Well, we don't have the answers to that yet, um, but that's something that over the next few years we want to look at. So there's lots of work for the future. This is just the beginning. It's my first year and hopefully when I can go back to the museum again, we can keep looking at these issues that potentially have effect on the collection's care.
while we're over in the UK, we're still collecting that data, which is really good news. So we can start to get a picture of what's going on. In such an extreme environment, um, trying to identify what's causing deterioration in objects is quite difficult. And so collecting all these, this data um, helps us diagnose those problems. And it's not an ideal world, so we can't recreate the perfect environment. It would be unsustainable, it would cost money, um, it would cost energy, and that's not what we want to do. What we're aiming for is to try and reach a point of balance where the objects are in harmony with the building, the building's in harmony with the environment, without us having um, to apply any direct intervention or any um, major intervention, such as trying to heat whole building which doesn't seem right in such a sensitive environment as South Georgia. A lot of the objects have now become acclimatized to that extreme environment and so are stable in a very um, delicate way. By adding lots of visitors are we adding to the problem and is there anything we can do to try and balance that problem? We want people to come to the museum. Obviously visitors are very important to the museum there weren't visitors then what's the reason for the museum to exist so it's trying to think about how we can create that balance so i'm hoping with a combined approach um, and a long-term view of the museum and environment within the building um, if we can establish that keep monitoring then hopefully that data collection over the next two or three years we can create some simple cost-effective solutions to looking after that collection. Um, so that's my last slide and I just want to say thank you for listening. I hope some of it makes sense and hopefully I'll speak to you again in another year and let you know how we're getting on. <clears throat> Hello everyone. So as uh, our curator Jane Pierce didn't get an opportunity to talk to you live on the 8th of October, uh, we've decided to give you a little bonus uh, Q&A session with her and asking the questions today will be myself, Alison Neal, Chief Executive of the Trust and Jane Bevan, who is our newest trustee. So uh, over to Jane for the first question. Okay, well I wanted to start by asking you Jane, um, You've obviously got wide experience of working in museums in the UK sector, and yet now you find yourself in, in South Georgia, the South Georgia Museum. And I wondered sort of what you feel you're going to bring particularly to that, that, that role. Um. Um, so the South Georgia Museum is um, quite different from where I've worked before. I've worked um, with collections as small as 200 objects to 2 million objects. And I've worked in all aspects of museum life from dusting display cabinets to managing a team of curate, curators and conservators. So I've, I feel like I've seen every angle of how a museum functions. And I think that's really helpful to understand how all of those aspects come together to make a museum work and to open up to visitors. Um, one of the fundamental points of a museum is having objects and preserving objects. And the objects are core to a museum and all of those stories. And visitors, when they come to a museum, uh, objects really help engage and make a connection to the visitors to those stories without objects you know a museum is all is, is nothing and so one of my skills I think is looking forward to the future so South Georgia Museum is 30 years old now it was opened in 1992 and if we want to make sure the museum stays open for another 30 years another 50 years we have to really look after the collections and really think about how we preserve the objects and the stories for the future and to, to maintain that legacy and look forward um, and I hope my experience and looking at all of those aspects of museum work can really help tell that story. Mm. Great. So as a museum professional, what would you say are the unique selling points of the South Georgia Museum? So the South Georgia Museum is quite wonderful and there can't be many museums like it on the planet. And one of its super, super strengths, I think, if you're visiting the museum in South Georgia, is that you're able to 
make a real connection with what's happening outside the museum and what the museum is trying to say. To get to the museum in Gripwickham, you have to walk through the heritage site of the whaling station. You have to pick your way through the wildlife to get to the front door. And you know, you're right there in it, the wildlife, the weather, the, the, the atmosphere. As soon as you walk into the museum and look at the displays, you have an instant connection to those displays because you can see it happening outside the window of the museum. And that's a, a really um, significant strength of the museum. Um, in terms of people who are unable to visit South Georgia, um, one of its strengths is that connection between human intervention and nature. And that's really, really um, significant today. And it's a really important subject here. And I think South Georgia Museum has a really um, important role in telling that story um, and I think it's very powerful. <clears throat> so um, what do you think the key challenges are in getting the museum ready for the, oh, for the museum's UK accreditation scheme? Um, I mean in the UK accreditation is something that um, is open to um, all museums and I understand at the moment that's not the case for South Georgia but it is a sort of it's a standard isn't a gold standard for museum operations. Yes so being part of the museum accreditation scheme, it, it, it strengthens that network between museums and being part of that network is really, really helpful to a museum and it strengthens their role um, as a museum. But also it opens up opportunities for funding, which is obviously critical. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, it strengthens the knowledge that we're doing our job well. It means mm -hmm. that we, you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. doing what we're supposed to be doing and creating a legacy for the future. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of that work is behind the scenes. It's very mm. unsexy. It's <laughs> sitting at the desk, um, you know, plodding, plodding away at a database, writing policies and plans and making sure all the records are kept in order. And it's, it's interesting, but um, not exciting. And <laughs> that's really hard to get funding for, you know, there's no there's no immediate results from doing that work. It's a result that you get in 30, 40, 50 years ahead. Mm -hmm. So one of, I guess, my challenges as curator is to balance that behind the scenes work with creating work and content to engage the visitors. Obviously the visitors coming to the museum is important mm -hmm. as much as behind the scenes. And it's that, it's that balance. Mm -hmm. um, of work, you know, as I go through as I go through my day to day role, um, mm. and that that's that's the challenge. Mm. Keep all yeah. the balls juggling. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And what ideas do you have around building the museum's digital profile to extend its outreach and impact? So, oh, at the moment, obviously, we've got the COVID situation, so mm. lots of museums are shut anyway, and having to think about all of these angles um, but but one of the issues with the South Georgia Museum is that it's a remote museum and not everybody can get there so it's trying to think how we can um, embrace digital um, social media to sort of to spread the word and to engage people in the museum and just last week we launched um, an Instagram account and that's going really really well and I think Instagram works really well because you can create um, little sound bites, little stories with images just for people to dip in and out of. And I think that's works really well in this world. You know, people can just collect facts and images. Um, and for the people who want to engage a bit deeper and want more information, they can then go to the website. So it's trying to um, make that connection between Facebook and Instagram and a deeper story on, on the web pages and try and build the website so people can go deeper if, if they want to so that that's the plan um, and that's you know at the moment because of the covid situation we've got time to work on that and and that's what people seem to want um, so it's quite exciting and yeah and we've got a challenge <laughs> we've got the you, you've you've instigated the new um object of the month as well haven't you yeah so the the collection is not a huge collection, but it's got some really, really fascinating things. And, and one of the most frustrating things, I think, is not being able to see what's in the cupboard of a museum. But the <laughs> idea is to try and bring some of those things that are in the cupboards of the museum to, to 
Instagram and to the website, just so people get to see a bit more. Uh, I mean, can you talk a little bit about some of the new exhibitions you might be thinking about? I mean, I realise there's a sort of short sort of season, isn't it, when visitors come, but you must be having thoughts about what you could do to take uh, the, the marriage between, if you like, the, the objects you were talking about earlier, but also the display aspects and that kind of communication um, objective. Yeah, so one, one of the um, areas that I'm interested in is it, obviously visitors get to go to South Georgia, but their visits are quite short. Mm. And so it's almost like they're having a, a, an Instagram, you know, they run around the museum, you know, picking things that are, catch their eyes and they don't get that full experience of the museum because they don't mm. have time. And also because of COVID, people are looking more towards digital engagement. And I think we can offer not just the visitors to the museum, but people who can't get to the museum, mm -hmm. the same thing. And I think that's um, through the website. And so we, we're planning exhibitions for next October, so the next season for the actual museum. Mm -hmm. And that, but what we want to try and do is and connect them to the website so there's a bigger story. Mm -hmm. So we've got three big things happening. Um, on site there is, um, on the heritage site, there is um, a heritage building called the Main Store. Um, it's like a giant hardware store that all the whalers kept all their nuts and bolts and hammers <laughs> and you know, it is like hardware store. And that's all intact and it's really fantastic. And the plan is to open up to the public. So um, hopefully next season, if all goes ahead, who knows, um, the idea is that that store will be open to the public and they can walk through. And so we're trying to put together some displays, set dress mm. it, put some interpretation mm. up to engage visitors with that store and how the store connects to the whaling story. Mm -hmm. In the museum, um, I also want to talk more about whales and, you know, the whale and what whales are, populations are like around South Georgia and what current research is happening around South Georgia. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of that comes, a lot of that data and research is coming from the South Georgia Heritage Trust and how we can tell that story. So that's another small display we want to do, but I think we can bring that onto the website and connect South Georgia Heritage Trust to that as well, to the museum. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it's the, the big one, is um, next year is a centenary of the um, Quest uh, Rowlett expedition and that's a Shackleton's last expedition to Antarctica and unfortunately his untimely death um, in January 1921 uh, so it's 100 years and so we're going to um, I was going to say celebrate but that's probably the wrong word um, acknowledge those 100 years of past and tell, retell that story mm -hmm. and so that's going to be a physical exhibition in the museum um, really really popular and we're hoping you know to, to give their um the visitors um that story and give them some information about the funeral and the connection to britvik and, and to the whaling station so that's huge and again we want to extend that story from the museum to to the website and so we can connect to people who can't make it to south georgia that's very exciting <laughs> Are there any plans to extend the work that was done to record the oral histories of the whalers? So yes, this is another exciting idea we have. I get lots of um, emails and messages from um, families of ex-whalers and they want to see pictures or find out more about their life in South Georgia. And so I think what would be really nice is if we can create um, a place on the website where people can connect to those stories so images documents you know video footage and what would be really wonderful is if we can connect as well by getting people to engage with the website so they bring their stories to the website and so so the idea is that it can grow into almost like a forum but so people can take images but add images too and then that would also include i hope some oral histories and take that story a bit bigger and a bit wider and the other thing that would be really lovely is if we could maybe connect to some other museums in the UK for example a lot of the whalers on South Georgia were from Scotland and so I know that in Scotland there are museums such as the Shetland Museum that has 
a really lovely archive and connection to ex whalers on Shetland and then all of those stories can and networks can come together um, and I think that'd be a really nice way of connecting people that can't actually come to South Georgia it's it'll be digital and and sort of uh, you're talking about funding earlier and I just wondered sort of what part you felt that the museum could play in in um, SGHT's charitable work in the in the coming year years maybe so I think museums have a very I think important role in society that you, they they're very important to capture knowledge and that's what they're there for is to capture knowledge capture objects capture stories and preserve that knowledge and those objects and those stories and then pass that knowledge and history on to you know present and future generations mm -hmm. and that, that's I guess the fundamental part of our work with the museum and I, I, I think with um, the connection to the South Georgia Heritage Trust is that they're doing a similar role. They're trying to preserve the heritage of the island. They're trying to preserve the wildlife. And that's how they're connected. And I think the museum is a really brilliant platform to be able to talk about that message and get mm -hmm. that message across and inspire and educate. And mm -hmm. also to try and um, engage people to you know, take responsibility and take action. And, and that's what South Georgia Heritage Trust is doing. And, and I think they, you know, they work really well together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane, for that. And it's great to see that your work and the work of the museum is continuing despite everything. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> from, from my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Bye for now. Um, Camilla, I think you're going to be leading off on the Q&A. I am indeed. Thank you very much. Um, speakers, Sophie, Jeff, uh, Sarah, thank you so, so much for wonderful presentations. Um, we've had lots of questions. Uh, you'd be pleased to hear. Um, so I've um, compiled a list and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, we'll take about, we've got 15 minutes left of the session, but we, we may go on a little longer if people are willing to uh, hang on. Um, but first question, uh, this is in from Jay. Having been to South Georgia, Island, I was a bit puzzled by the decision to keep all the old whaling stations. I understand the importance of historical lessons by keeping perhaps Gritbikin, but the others should be removed. Can you explain why they've been all been allowed to remain? I think this is probably one for Sarah. Um, it, it, it more than likely comes down to money. Um, there, you know, there's many arguments over whether these sites should be preserved or whether they should be removed and left at what they call a greenfield site. But just to give you an idea, I believe I'm right in saying that the cleanup that you saw uh, illustrated in, in my talk cost the government £6 million, and that was everything pretty much that they had in reserves at the time. Uh, costs for removing whaling stations now, of course, are much, much, much higher than that. And so I think uh, it is probably purely down to money. Sarah, thank you. You. Okay, uh, this was from uh, M. Harvey. I had the pleasure of hearing your guided tour, Sarah, uh, in person last, uh, last early November. It was an unusually warm day. I remember the anecdote about the men buying a lot of men's perfume, so-called to get rid of the stench. <laughs> in fact, as they were not allowed to drink alcohol, they used the perfume as a substitute. Can you confirm? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, it's a true story. Um, the, the old records from what was called the slop chest, it was the the shop that the uh, the whalers could go to, they could spend their wages there. Had a, they all had accounts there to buy everything that they needed. Uh, and because they weren't allowed to drink alcohol, because otherwise they weren't fit for work, uh, there were many ways of getting around it. One of them was to buy cologne, male perfume, uh, and drink it for the alcohol content. They also, uh, they, and we have one in the museum and several around the site, uh, they used to brew their own. Um, so, you know, going to that kitchen where we saw our, our guide Lorna, um, they would be able to get a bit of yeast and some old potato peelings and they would make some evil brews uh, and many a good party was held in, in the whalers accommodation. Thank you. This one for Sophie. Any story to tell about the paintings on the bedroom at walls at Port Lockroy? Yes, I think, well, maybe should I show, I have actually got a few pictures of them and I could show people if they know, don't know what these Please are. They're, they're quite iconic. If you let me share my screen again, I've got a couple up. 
Um, so yeah. So this is uh, what we we're talking about. So these are these are paintings. They're almost all of them in the in the bunk room at Port Lockroy, um, and the whole of Port Lockroy was fully restored in the 1990s uh, because the building had suffered, you know, the kind of damage which one more year it probably would have disappeared completely. Um, and so lots of rooms were repainted. And then at a certain point later on, it was discovered actually that they had somebody had at some point painted over these. Um, and it seems as if they were actually painted sometime in uh, 1960, I think, by the diesel mechanic using exactly the same paints as are all over everything else. It's that they are like, yeah, room colored paints. And I guess he's mixed some together. So this is um, a painting of Diana Dawes. Um, and we have also got, uh, this is, sorry, Doris Day. Uh, there's actually a pinup of her on, on the picture as well, so you can kind of confirm that it's Doris Day. <laughs> uh, we've got, um, this apparently is, oh no, maybe that's Diana Dawes, I'm not too sure now. There's a Jane, there's another Jane, does anyone know? I'm not very good on my, on my 1940s, 50s pinups, I'm afraid. I can't remember which one this one is. Um, we also have Elizabeth Taylor, kind of in her Cleopatra phase. Um, and here we've got purportedly, uh, possibly Audrey Hepburn and Sophia Loren. Uh, they're all quite well endowed, I think. And it seems as though possibly that's the reason why they were painted out, but nobody knows who painted them out. But the fact is they've now become, you know, one of the most iconic things at Port Lockroy. And uh, they featured in a, a set of stamps from the British Antarctic Territories a few years ago as well. So we definitely want to keep them and preserve them. I think they're quite extraordinary, you know, how well done they are, given that the man who painted them was not a professional artist and he was using quite, um, you know, basic materials and painting possibly over not a very clean surface either. So they're not doing brilliantly in conservation terms. They do need a bit of work um, to stop them flaking. As you can see, there's a certain amount of flaking has happened already. And yeah, so they're one of the things that we've got our eyes on and want to do something about quite quickly. Camilla, you might have something to add to this, and possibly Alison could also take my screen away again and get us back to where we should be. Yes. Uh, no, nothing for me specific to add. I think uh, these are fragile but and uh, unique. And I think uh, do do need that special care. I think yes. a number of them were also painted on the cupboard doors in, in the bunk room. And when the base was shut, they decided to put shutters on the windows to pr to protect them so they wouldn't break while no one was there. And an easy way to do that was to take the cupboard doors off. So they actually took the cupboard doors off that had some of the painted ladies on and screwed them over the windows and passing ships would wonder what was happening in Port Lockroy because they could see strange images, shall we say, on the windows. So there's an interesting story attached to the painted lady, certainly. Yes, they are endlessly interesting, I think. Uh, I think uh, a couple of suggestions that uh, Jane Mansfield may be uh, the blonde uh, on the yes. door. But um, yes, I think it is often debated who's who. Which one is which? And there is a Marilyn Monroe in the in the generator room, and there's also a Jane Russell, who I quite like. She's on a, she's on one of the bunk room yes. cupboard doors, but I didn't have a picture of her, so... Brilliant. Thank you. OK, Jeff, one for you. Well, well two, really. A uh, quick one. What is a hold down exactly? And secondly, uh, I guess from what you said, that there will be never be double glazing used to replace the windows at these historic sites. Um, a hold down. Um, certainly in the earlier period, they were very worried and, about the buildings getting blown away by the very strong winds that they anticipated that there would be down there. And so they actually put steel hawsers over the roofs of the building and then put anchors in, in, into the ground. They cemented iron eyes into the ground and then put the attached these metal cables to them to, to actually stop the, the buildings moving and vibrating in the wind. So that, that, that's the hold down. And sorry, Camilla, can you remind me of a second question? The double, would you ever replace the windows with double glazing? Ah, that, that's a very topical question because that many of the windows are double glazed, but they're 1940s style double glazed. So that they're actually two separate panes of glass that are being fitted into the window. So it's got two rebates for glass in there, but they don't have what would be called modern double glazing in that they don't have the, the gas between them to, to form a double glazed unit per se. But in the past, some windows have been replaced at Port Lockroy, which do have modern double glazing in, but the through the conservation management review program, we're looking at whether those windows should be replaced and returned back to original specification, 1940 star double glazing. So no, we wouldn't look to, to install modern double glazing in, in the buildings. 
we, we, we would look to, to actually go back to the original double glazing. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I've had a few questions about Deception Island, Whalers Bay. Um, who looks after Whalers Bay and uh, um, what is its, what's its future? I'll propose that to Jeff if that's, if that's possible. Um, Whalers Bay is a complex one. Certainly it's a, a site which has buildings from a number of different nationalities, uh, including the British, and buildings from all sorts of areas. It has a bit of a, a past to it that it has been subject to volcanic activity uh, and some of the buildings have been removed by, by mud flows that, that happened on the island and so that's part of the reasons why the, the island was actually abandoned the bases that were there. The, the ownership and so hence who would actually manage the buildings and the conservation of them is clouded by this multinationality ownership of the buildings and so it's a more of a political challenge. The buildings themselves are eminently savable. I, I, I save buildings which are in, in far worse condition and I would love to, to see those buildings saved and all the stories associated with them but the ownership and the funding and everything that would go with it is such a complex mine, minefield. Agreed, agreed. Okay, back to South Georgia. Um, is the church at Gritwick managed by any particular domination? denomination? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, mm, slightly tricky one to answer. I hope I'm getting this correct. It, originally, it was built as a Lutheran church. Uh, it's now considered more multi-denominational. Um, it comes under the parish of Christchurch Cathedral, uh, in Stanley Fork and Islands. Um, but the way it's managed now is that anybody who would like to use it for uh, community or religious um, events is, is normally absolutely fine. So um, I think it's very ecumenical these days. Thank you. Okay, one for each of you. Um, it was asked to Sophie, but I think each of you could probably answer this one. Um, apart from, uh, Sophie, the women's mags that you found, what were the uh, most unexpected artifacts that you found? So maybe each of you could suggest something unexpected that you found during your work down south. Well, I guess I, I still feel that everything to do with the gardening absolutely came out of left field for me. It, it, yes, it was the seed potatoes. It just took me such a long time to realise what they are. And I have seed potatoes. I, I garden myself and I had an allotment. I knew what they looked like and I just couldn't believe it when I saw them up there. And actually wasn't sure whether they were really an artifact and then I know that actually they are an artifact and I need to catalogue them along with everything else so yeah I think it's it's that and I still I'm quite charmed by it although I understand now that we, we can't in any way do any gardening in Antarctica and it's completely banned under the environmental protection rules and I absolutely understand that but uh, part of me also is quite quite impressed that they had a go so yeah those ones for sure. Sarah how about you? Well I have so many favourite things I've been casting around, but the one that I, I come back to time and time again, it's not on show in the museum, but I do love to take people up to see it. We keep it in our taxidermy workshop and it's a mummified cat. And uh, it's just evidence really, again, of what happened uh, around the island in, in days gone by. Uh, evidence of the many different species that were carried down there by the whalers mainly. Um, they had so many things with them. They had birds and dogs. They tried to farm foxes. Uh, they introduced rabbits deliberately. Uh, they even brought in various species of birds. They tried to introduce trout to the lakes. And uh, most of these things have died out naturally or, or have been uh, removed in recent times. Uh, but, you know, the, the remains of them, the animal bones that you find still up in the hills or the mummified cat of the cat that squirreled itself away feeling sick probably one day and in, in one of the buildings to be found decades later uh, is one of my favorites. And Jeff how about you? Um, found many 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 things probably one of the most interesting ones I've ever said I've ever found was a smoking pipe which I found just amongst some rocks down on the shore near Fish Trap Cove on Stonington Island and very close to those were some bearing shells from an engine. And actually further down on the beach is actually an engine in, in its entirety. 
And I can imagine that the, well, the engine is from one of the tanks, which was used by the Americans to, to haul their airplanes around on Stonington Island. And I can imagine that they were, must have been driving their tank along to Fish Track Cove, which is where they offload the ships. And it must have run a bearing in, in the engine. And so they basically took it apart on the beach. And you can imagine that the mechanic must have put his pipe down in amongst all these bits and pieces. Eventually worked out they couldn't fix it and took the engine out and threw that on the beach as, as they did in the 40s. And they must have thought, where's my pipe? Where's my pipe? And, and it's still sitting there waiting for him uh, three years ago when I was there. And I seem to have a habit of finding pipes because I found one underneath the Transantarctic Expedition Hut as well from the same era. So pipes <laughs> are an interesting thing. Obviously got a nose for them, Jeff. Yes. Not that <laughs> I'm a smoker. <laughs> a couple of questions around materials. Um, so this probably is uh, relevant to all three of you, but what's the biggest cause of deterioration of wood or, or other materials um, in the site? and how quickly do these things decay if you if, if untreated so Jeff we'll start with you and then maybe go to Sarah and, and um, certainly timber can decay but with moisture certainly on the Antarctic Peninsula Port Lockroy is very wet a lot of the time and it has a lot of penguin guano around which basically turns itself into a mud and so some of the floor bearers which are underneath the hut that they get encased in this liquid mulch of, or mud and that that does make them decay and, and they do rot further south so working in the Ross Sea where it's a lot colder you don't get that same rate of decay with, with, with timbers and you don't get that that same level of rot we also in the winter can get ice particles that get blown around by the wind and that actually defibrillates the timber and, and you can find that the wood fibers start to come apart and it actually wears in, in the, the growth bands of the timber. You actually get that the, each year the softer wood actually gets abraded away and you end up with that driftwood effect and that's due to the ice particles that get blasted against the, the buildings with the wind. Sarah, anything you want to like to add about uh, deterioration of materials in the southern polar regions? Yes, my, I was thinking particularly about wood, certainly not my area of expertise, but by all means we have some dry rot on the island. Um, I think the very cold climate is, is quite good probably for woods and things. And we're also, we're quite lucky that we don't have to deal with the sort of pests that can be common in UK, for instance, uh, museums we don't have to worry too much because of our cold climate it 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 doesn't enable things like clothes moths woodworm um to survive down there so actually that that all helps but other than that not really my expertise and sophie any quite so on materials in your world <laughs> oh, for sure <laughs> absolutely it's all about the materials so in, I think, ironically, the wood inside the huts um, that I've looked at has been in fantastic condition and is very, very stable because it's protected from the weather. I mean, as long as there isn't a leak in the roof or something like that, it does quite well. Um, and similarly, things like rubber, which often doesn't do at all well in, in our climate here, is doing fantastically there. And one of the things people say about rubber, if you want to preserve it for a long time, you should freeze it. And clearly that's happening naturally for these materials you know, down in the south. So that's great, but the ones that are not doing well are the metals, and there's an enormous quantity of metal tins with food in them, and uh, just the moisture levels in the huts. And it's quite noticeable, so different parts of the huts, if you are facing south or facing east, you tend to get colder, moister air in that area, and then you'll see more deterioration of metals, loads and loads of rust. So if I were to prioritise the things that are in the worst shape, um, apart from our painted ladies and their flaking, um, I would say it's metal, all of it's metal. Um, and after that, it's paper because paper is very vulnerable because it's so thin. So, you know, if there's an, an agent of deterioration, it just gets to the paper quickly because it's not inherently a very strong material. Um, and I guess the other thing is light levels. Um, so if you have a, a lot of light coming through and, it, and although the light is only there in the summer part of the year, it's pretty strong some of the time. And so you get fading. And so some of those original curtains that you might have seen, the sort of gingham ones are quite shredded by just light damage. So it's environmental factors for the most part. Um, but yeah, as long as the building's there, things are all right. So that's why it's Jeff's important job to make sure the buildings don't blow down or fall apart. 
Indeed, thank you. Uh, on a sort of similar vein, um, how is uh, climate change or global warming affecting uh, the, the sites and the artifacts and also um, how they're managed? So perhaps, uh, Jeff, do you want to start with that one? Um, certainly, you can see the impacts of climate change. Stonington Island, again, to, to refer to that site, the most southerly one of ours, you, that site was chosen because there used to be a glacier, which the, the Northeast Glacier, which used to actually connect across to the island and they could then sledge up the glacier and, and then onto the, onto the peninsula itself and then explore north or south from there. In the 70s, that, that the glacier started to break up. It's always been crevassed throughout its life, but it did start to break up quite significantly and there were alternative means for exploration using planes, etc. So that, that's why the base was closed. Since then, the glacier has retreated and now the glacier is about 250 metres maybe away from the island itself. It, it is, the island is now an island once again. And well, I was there three years ago and spent 12 weeks, uh, 11 weeks on the island do, doing our surveys and repairs to it. And the glacier was constantly carving and, and, and breaking up while we were there. I briefly visited again this year and you can see that the glacier is far more broken up now. Even over those, those, that three year period, you can see that the glacier is disintegrating, degrading and, and falling apart. Certainly we can see that. I think an impact of that is going to be potentially on the sea ice and where, where the ships can get further south. It's clearly going to change the distribution of different fauna that are down there. So the penguins, I can imagine their distributions are going to change. And clearly having a warm, warmer, more humid environment further south it is going to potentially have, have impacts on the buildings and the contains artifacts. And so I can see that the rate of decay could, could increase potentially. Thank you. And Sarah, South Georgia, how is, how is climate change impacting your work there? Uh, yeah, I, I, our answer would, would echo Jeff's, I think. Um, the, the climate is warming. Um, the weather, if anything, is less predictable. Um, I'm not aware at the current time of a measurable effect what, on the museum and, and, and what we're doing within it, but on, on a longer scale, I guess that's something that we might actually notice a change in. But in terms of our environment, um, the changes in the time I've been on the island are marked. Um, I often find myself answering the same question when we're on the island, you know, do, does, it, does, does climate change, is it real? Um, and I, I always say to people, well, that there's two glaciers that we would be able to walk to from where we work uh, that no longer exist. Um, they, they have disappeared just in the time that I've been there. So, yeah, it, it's very real. We certainly see the effects on the environment, but not yet uh, within the museum. Thank you. Uh, one for uh, Sophie and Jeff around about uh, Faraday uh, Vernadsky Station, the former British station, of course, um, and now a worthy house part of that um, suite. Uh, why was it um, sold to the Ukraine instead of being part of the um, British Heritage um, Suite, uh, given its history? Jeff, do you want to start that one? Mm, that's a good question. I'm, <laughs> Briefly, if you can. <laughs> I'm not completely sure exactly why Faraday was sold to, to the Ukrainians. I can tell you that the pound that they sold it for is encapsulated in the bar at, at Bernadsky and, the, and that's still there. So they got a very good deal. They sold it for a pound and kept the pound. The exact reason why it was sold, I, I'm not certain, certainly not aware of. Sophie, did you? No, I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't. I don't know very much about that site at all. I'm afraid, so I can't add to that. Sorry. That's okay. I mean, I can add a little, I suppose. Um, during the 1990s, there was a big survey of all the abandoned bases on the Antarctic Peninsula, and uh, they were, um, and the, the destiny, you know, the destinies of each of these uh, could be they could be removed as, as waste, they could be preserved as historic sites, uh, they could be put back into use. Um, uh, or by the currently you know, the owning nation or by another nation. Um, I think it was three, yes, yeah. And it was decided that uh, so seven sites were identified as uh, 
extremely historically significant from a British point of view. Um, those are the six that we look after plus Whalers Bay. Uh, and Vernadsky was still uh, serviceable. It was still a usable um, site um, and it was uh, offered to other nations and uh, the Ukrainians said, actually, we'll, we'll use it. Um, we, can, we can look after it. And the deal was they would look after the historic aspects of, of uh, Faraday um, and if you visit there now you'll still see a lot of the artifacts of the, the um, winterist photographs and that sort of thing um, are still intact um, but they still use it and still run it and that, that also happened at um, another site as well uh, that was taken over by Uruguayans and again it's just it's, they felt it was better to keep using these sites rather than go to the expense of either removing them or if they hadn't been necessarily quite as significant as the other sites that were designated as historic sites and monuments under the Antarctic Treaty. So it was a, it was a complicated time, I think, and there, was, there were some tough decisions made and not all of them were popular for sure. Okay, I can move on to another question. So um, again, a question for all of you. What is, what, uh, and a couple of people have asked, asked this, what is the most exciting thing coming up for you in terms of the conservation programmes uh, at your various places? Um, Sarah, do you want to start? I would think for us uh, as a museum, we, we took on um, a new curator a year ago and this first year uh, of her placement has allowed her really to assess the museum, its challenges um, and to, to answer those. And then uh, we really now have the capacity to start planning for the future uh, and so there, there's much that we want to incorporate uh, and there's much that we want to try to do better. So there's lots of good challenges ahead. Um, hard to pick on on any one in particular. Okay, uh, Sophie. Um, well, I think I'm excited about the fact that we're now actually planning what, how we might go about doing a conservation program at Horseshoe Island. So it's great to have you know, gone there and gathered all this information and got really fired up about the place and then feel now we can carry this through and, and start to look at, you know, what are our options and how could we really make this happen? So that that is a prospect that's uh, very exciting for me. And um, and I'm also, you know, somebody's alluded to it earlier, actually, I think, was we, we talked about the digitisation of, um, of some of the radio messages. And I think that would make an amazing citizen science project. And I don't know if there's any possibility of that at this point, but I would be delighted to see that come off and do something to back it up if possible. Wonderful. And Jeff, certain, certainly, as, as Sophie says, an exciting part is is looking to the future and and moving from this survey and emergency repair program, which we're in at the moment, and moving into actually doing some conservation work and the implementation plan. So we're actually writing Horseshoe Island implementation plan at the moment and looking at how long it will take, how many people and then looking at all the different components that we surveyed and Sophie surveyed all those years ago and starting to put some time and figures and what plan, how should we do that? Looking at the significance of the site and bringing all this data and information that we've gathered over the last years and bringing that all together and thinking how we can take that forward in, in, into the future. Uh, and that, that's a really exciting part of the programme that we're actually going to be doing the conservation work rather than just talking and thinking and, and planning, but actually thinking, right, hopefully this, a, a year in the future, when, when, when hopefully COVID has, has released us and allowed us to get back down there, we can actually think we can get on and we can, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it and this is how long it's going to take and actually bringing that in, into real life, that, that's a, a very exciting part. And then that's just for one site and there's all the, the other five to, to think of as well. So. Yeah, it's an exciting time in the future, I think. I would agree. We've had lots of questions about the Rat Eradication Project. Um, what I might do, um, uh, and I'm uh, going to tantalise you a little longer, but perhaps um, we'll organise another one of these that will focus on that a bit more so we can get, really get under the skin of uh, looking after uh, these sites from a biodiversity point of view. Um, so if, you do, if everyone doesn't mind, um, we'll stick with the, uh, the heritage conservation today, but let's pick up on Rat Eradication and Habitat and Restoration um, in a future event. Okay, um, thinking about living and working uh, 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 for our organisations, um, how, how can you work for UKHT uh, down on the peninsula or, or for the South Georgia Heritage Trust down in South Georgia? Sarah, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, um, we, we actually don't even advertise, Camilla. We have um, enough people who come on through the island um, who are looking for ways to, to come uh, and spend time on the island. 
and we have enough people just get in touch with us um, that we don't advertise. But um, most people who have an interest will contact us directly um, through our head or our head uh, office in Dundee. Uh, and and that, that's the way we recruit for the three jobs that we're able to um, advertise each year. We also bring in um, a curatorial intern on quite a regular basis, but that is a, a restricted um, uh, place. We, we, we only take a, a student from the St Andrews University um, for, for that placement, but we're very excited to be uh, starting that up again uh, as soon as we can return to the museum. Thank you. And Jeff or Sophie, would you like to talk about how you get to work for us? Yes, well, the, for the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, as people or many people on, on this call will be aware, that Port Lockroy, we, we, we open each season and we recruit for, for the four people that, that come down there and, and live at Port Lockroy in the Nissen Hut and, and, and look after Bransfield House and the boat shed, etc. And we do that annually. So, that, and those jobs get advertised on our website and we go through a recruitment process for that. From the conservation team perspective, we, 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 as I mentioned, we're, we're in this survey and evaluation phase at the moment. And um, we're largely taking experienced people that, that many of us have worked in polar environments before and experience, like say, I worked for the New Zealand Trust before I worked for the UK Trust. But as we've just talked about, in the coming years ahead, we will actually be starting doing a conservation program. So we will need some people with conservation specialist skills. And it's, as I mentioned during the talk, it's not just conservation skills, it's, it's also having the, the right attitude and, and the, the right way of going about working and being happy to work in, in such environments. So I can see in the future, we will be advertising for people to come in and join the conservation team to, to work with us on, on conserving these huts. So keep a lookout. I can't, can't say what the time frame is going to be and certainly this last last year's taught us that it's very difficult to plan for, for time frames but certainly in the years ahead shall we say that, that there will be opportunities I think to work on the conservation programme with the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. Great, thank you. We are we do have more questions than we can probably answer this evening, but what I might do, given it's quarter to nine uh, here in the UK anyway, uh, the last question I'm going to pose is how is COVID-19, so it picks up on what you just said, Jeff, how is COVID-19 impacting conservation work and our operations in South Georgia and Antarctica? Sarah, do you want to go first with the... Uh, for South Georgia? Yes, sadly, it, it, it means that we are unable to open the museum um, for this, this coming season. Um, and, that, you know, it's just one of those things. We're very lucky that uh, things like um, the work that we're doing to conserve the artifacts and so on on the island is always done on a precautionary basis. So we're not especially worried about the fact that we're not going to reach the museum necessarily. Uh, in the months ahead. Um, and we just very much hope that as, as everybody does, things will have resolved uh, sufficiently that we will be able to get to the following season, not least because it should be a very exciting year for us um, as we'll be celebrating a major centenary event um, with the centenary of Shackleton's Crest Expedition. And of course, when he sadly died at Gritvicken. So uh, please don't let us miss out on that. Thank you. Uh Jeff, do you want to comment on the impact of COVID on uh, UKHT operations? Yes, certainly, uh, uh, as Sarah's just mentioned, uh, that it has, COVID's having an impact on, on a lot of activities that are happening in the South this year and all sorts of programmes and all nations, as far as I'm aware, and there's their field science, etc. And, and basically, the programmes that are basically keeping their lights on and keeping the, the, the staff that are down there and the bases that are active down there and that, that are manned. And so that's where the focus is. There's a whole heap of rigmaroles around quarantines in order to be able to travel south and the staff having to go through that. And so we're also subject to the same, same restrictions on movements and, and, and traveling around. It's not purely about traveling down there and getting to sites like Port Lockroy, et cetera. It's then about the support and, and the, the safety of staff that would be down there and the number of ships that would be around to provide 
support to, to people that are working down there and working remotely. So clearly anything that has an impact on, on the number of ships and the, the traveling around is going to have a huge impact on, on the actual field seasons down there this year. And it's certainly impacting the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust field season. So the, there won't be a conservation team traveling south this year to, to, to work on, on the huts. But at the same time, that means that we are having this opportunity to, to address a number of these planning issues. And so we're still working full steam ahead on the conservation planning side of things to then get us in a good position when, when COVID is no longer, imagine that, COVID is no longer having an impact on, on our travel, et cetera, and our plans, and we can actually enact these plans. So the, the, the silver lining in it is that, is that it's giving us more time to, to do this planning and preparation work rather than actually out doing field work this season. So from a conservation perspective, it does, it has put a pause on things actually in the field, but it's enabling us to do more in the future. So it, that there, are, there is some light at the end of the tunnel of the COVID situation. Great, Jeff, thank you. Um, I'd like to th put a uh, stop now to the questions and answers. We do have other ones and we'll maybe find a way of answering those uh, using social media or something um, uh, after this. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much to our contributors. So Sarah, Jeff and Sophie, thank you for putting the time into prepare your presentations and to answering your questions so eloquently. So thank you very much. A virtual round of applause to you. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank uh, the people who organised this, so Alison and Lisa and Penny and, and everyone behind the scenes who uh, put all this together and have been frantically working behind the scenes, uh, organising the questions and keeping everybody uh, happy, so thank you. Um, and to all of you who joined us this evening for your questions, for your um, comments, very generous comments, thank you, um, and for, for spending the time with us this evening and to help us um, explore a little bit of the Southern Ocean once again. Um, Talk of COVID, COVID is having a massive impact on both our organisations as um, as you've heard tonight. We're unable to run our normal seasons, which means a massive uh, loss of income for both our organisations. So if you have enjoyed this evening, uh, please do consider making a donation to support our work. Um, the details are on screen now and we'll be sharing those um, by email again tomorrow. But uh, please do consider helping us. Uh, we are going to run some more of these. Um, so we're going to planning the next one um, because I think this one's been a success by the looks of things, mm -hmm. uh, but please uh, support our vital work. Um, it's, it is important work, as I'm sure you agree, um, and uh, we'd love to keep sharing um, the stories that we, uh, we uncover. So please do give, uh, please do join us again, and uh, say thank you very much to everybody who's taken part and for all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. <laughs>